What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another installment of The House List. This is my weekly podcast. My name is Peter Agostin. I just marked your name right off the list. You're back up in here. You're in the building. You're in the house with Peter Agostin on this very special episode with my man, Molecules, from The Legion. I'm very excited about uh, this show. Um, before we get into me breaking it all down, uh, I want to thank you guys for tuning in. Um, you can now uh, catch The House List on Google Play. So if you prefer Google Play or know somebody that does that would be into this, let them know. Yo, check out The House List podcast from Peter Agostin. It's on Google Play now. But otherwise, you know, just paying a little bit of dues here. It is on iTunes. If you che- if this is your first time checking it out, please subscribe and rate it on iTunes. If you can take a couple seconds to do that, that helps me out a tremendous amount. At least I think so. Um, you can also peep it out on SoundCloud. A lot of people do check it out on SoundCloud. If you do, I also recommend you to subscribe there. If that's how you check out podcasts, I know right now people listen to it in different ways. Um, so, you know, check it out there. If you are listening to it on SoundCloud, though, hit that re that repost button if you dig this, because then that way other people might be able to catch it. And, you know, let's just do a word of mouth thing for now, especially if you're a fan of the Legion, as I am. If you're unfamiliar with the Legion, they are Bronx based hip hop trio um, in the most classic sense uh, from the foundation laid by the Cold Crush Brothers. Um, and if you know the, the club, the historic New York city, Bronx based nightclub, the rooftop, then the Legion and the rooftop play a big role in one another. The legendary Brucey B, the DJ, this is all stuff that we talk about with my special guest tonight on the show, Molecules of the Legion, my man, big man Cules. Uh, the producer, um, one of the vocalists of the group. The Legion basically is a uh, has three members, Molecules, Chucky Smash, and CeeLo the Dice Man. I've been a huge fan of this group since they first came out. Now, they've only put out one actual album, um, one proper full-length debut album, yeah, which was their first album. came out in 1994 on Polygram Records, Mercury and One Love Records, which was the short-lived label by Drez of Black Sheep. It was called Theme Plus Echo Equals Krill. Um, And it was, uh, uh, even back then, I got it when it first came out. When I was doing radio at the time in Virginia at WUVT in Blacksburg, Virginia, Virginia Tech. And they had two monster singles that were both have videos in rotation. So I think a lot of people came to know the Legion because of MTV, Yo! MTV Raps, uh, Rap City. And the box, depending on what region you may have lived in, what country you lived in. Uh, The two singles were Jingle Jangle and Legion Groove. So, without giving you, like, breaking down the group into too many factoids, uh, you know, I guess if you were a fan... Now, this is for the hip-hop heads or true hip-hop heads, especially from the East Coast or New York, but really it doesn't matter where you're from uh, at all, period. But if you... Um, came up or really favor the DITC sound, digging in the crates, showbiz and AG, black sheep. Now the Legion kind of came out of this uh, nucleus or really was part of this particular uh, set, subsect of, of artists, which was showbiz and AG, black sheep and Chi Ali. And then the Legion kind of fit amongst that, which is all within sort of the, the universe that a lot of, uh, the, the digging in the crates artists from the Bronx and from uptown, uh, New Rochelle. So including brand Nubian, Lord Finesse, Diamond D, um, a grip of other people. So this album was, um, I don't know. I, I it just always made a big impression on me later on in life. We ended up doing some shows together. Molecules and I share like some, uh, um, stories about those experiences. I had a pretty crazy experience at the venue. I, I used to work as a booker for, or the last night I was working there, my last night on the job, uh, bouncer, um, cold clock me, sucker punched me when I wasn't looking. 
and Kewels and, and, and some uh, friends of his have my back in the situation. It could have gotten really hairy. And we talk about that. We talk about him growing up. You know, his father played on the Mets. Um, he grew up in the Bronx. It's a classic New York story. We talk about the origin of the music. We talk about the, the rooftop and, and Brucey B. And in the intro, we use some, some of those clips. Brucey B plays a big role in in this uh, story as he as he's featured in clips of classic moments of him at the rooftop club are featured prominently uh, on the legion's debut album now they actually uh, put out some new material last year and in fact the reason why this conversation even came to be i guess in a way or at least sparked me to reach out to molecules and shout out to chucky smash and CeeLo the dice man for helping me all just kind of put this all together was that Molecules and Showbiz of Showbiz and AG, classic uh, Bronx hip-hop duo, um, have an EP coming out or a mini album called The Bronx Tale. So when this project was er in the early announcement of it, I was like, oh man, I got to reach out, man. I need to talk to him. We haven't talked in a while. And it turned out to be that this is actually Molecules' first real genuine interview, like a one-on-one -on -one style interview. So, you know, naturally when it's something like that, when it's your, uh, we, we ended up talking about all types of stuff. Uh, we even talked about the, the legend and lure of, 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 uh, notorious names like, um, uh, Rich Porter and Alpo, how they play into the role of that, that sound and the landscape of the Bronx, uh, in the eighties and nineties. And honestly, it was an incredible conversation, and, and I don't even want to go too far into it in this intro, um, but we cover a lot. It's a great story, a great tale. Um, it, listen, if you, ever, if you ever really sat and listened to Showbiz and AG's debut album, Runaway Slave, on the, the beginning of the title track, that's Molecules, uh, and you'll see because there's like this kind of intro, go back to that. Go back to, if you've never listened to the Legion album, Theme Plus Echo Equals Krill, listen to that. Th that'll give you a lot of context here. So, you know, if you know me, if you really know, like, how I get down, especially with hip-hop stuff, at least, uh, you know, and I like a lot of different kinds of hip-hop. I love a lot of different kinds of music in general, which you should know by now if you listen to this podcast. It's not just hip-hop. It's not just rock or any kind of experimental subsect of music where I kind of get down with a bunch of different stuff but um the legion is a group that I've always been a fan of even just because they have the one album and like an EP years later love both of them but molecules has actually produced a lot of stuff too later did some major label stuff that people never even were privy to went on tour with Justin Timberlake a, a gang of stuff so let's get into this conversation with my man molecules uh, definitely an honor to talk to the guy. Super cool dude. Came to the crib. And um, I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I enjoyed having a conversation with him. Thank you again. If you do like this and like what I'm doing with the Houseless podcast in general, please subscribe on iTunes or SoundCloud or Google Play or however you may check out podcasts and let people know, yo, Keep this out, man. Yo, you like, remember Legion? Remember how dope that was? Jingle, jangle, Legion groove, et cetera, et cetera. Yo, you need to listen to this conversation. All right, check it out here in the house. Let's y'all. I'd like to just start really just talking about like uh, growing up in New York. I mean, you're, yeah. from, are you, you're from the Bronx from originally, Bronx. right? Yes, from now, the Bronx. Now, I was listening, I, you know, since we kind of talked about linking up like a week or two ago or something like that. I went back to the album, the first, the, the Legion album, and I listened to it a lot of times, just kind of getting hyped up for it and revisiting it, because it's an album I, you know, I love that album. Um, you know, I'm a genuine fan of the group, too, obviously. Uh, and there's like a song, I forgot which one it is, it might be, it might be Back in the Days, I think that's the name of the song, I think, uh, where you said something about, did your father play on the oh, New York maybe, Mets? Okay, that song, oh. Is that um, did I hear yes, that no, lyric no, no, incorrectly? You're, right, or? you're, right. you're absolutely right. He um that I moved to Queens for a hot second. I was born in born in the Bronx and then um my father my father went to Clinton High School, that's in the Bronx as well. Okay. And he got uh 
they I believe they drafted him like, like in the late sixties or something like that. Oh wow. Yeah, so straight out of high school and um we ended up moving to Queens. I wanna say I was a little kid, maybe four or five years old. We didn't stay there long, but we was there for a little right. bit. We lived in uh, Woodside, Queens. Mm. Not, not far from Steinway Street. And then after that, we ended up moving. Like, he got he got injured. Uh-huh. Um, I think he messed up his wrist or something like that. He was a pitcher. Messed up his wrist. And then we ended up moving back to the Bronx when I was, like, fifth grade. Oh, wow. So it was really just uh, maybe through... The elementary school yeah, years. Elementary school. I was in Queens. I went to what's that school? PS one fifty one. Oh, okay. Yeah. I went to one fifty one. So you had you didn't know the guys in the group until no, until like, I got in the Bronx. I, I say I met Smash in the sixth grade when I moved to the Bronx. I moved to the Soundview section of the Bronx, um, Story Avenue, Colgate, and Smash lived in the next building from me. So I say I met Smash. I was in the sixth grade. Definitely by seventh grade we met. Oh, okay. And then me and him been running to this day. Sure. Yeah. yeah you know that's <laughs> Chucky Smash yeah. of the Legion. Exactly. So the Legion is three guys. It's, yeah. And CeeLo CeeLo yeah. lived right across the bridge from us. Okay. So I, what would that be? I want to say all right. CeeLo's from Bronxdale Projects, and me and Smash is from Lafayette. Um, Lafayette. Uh, it's like eight, ten, eight tall buildings right. on Long Story Avenue. He lived in, in the building next to me. CeeLo is from Bronxdale Projects. It's like a five-minute, seven-minute walk over a bridge. You walk over the right. bridge, and... They're kind of... Are they facing each other? Like, can you see... You can well, see one Well, the other? I want to say, when I got old, when I got older, I ended up getting an apartment, which I still have an apartment over there to this day. But I had an hmm. apartment on Boynton. You could see if you, well, my apartment was probably like, I think that was the 11th floor. But if you were on the 19th floor, you could probably see over to where C. Right. was built. Like his, as a matter of fact, his mother lives, the, her building, her apartment building is next to my junior high school. Oh, wow. I went to junior high school, 123. If I'm correct, I think like Bambada and Red Alert and them went there too. Okay. This is all in the vicinity of Bronx River. Right. You know, so CeeLo's mother's building is right next to my junior high school. So you guys all grew up quite yeah. close to one another. Yes, right. Yes. We, I, yeah, I met CeeLo. We probably met CeeLo. Me and, like I said, me and Smash always from young. We met CeeLo as we was leaving high school. Right. Um, I had done one of the earliest uh, episodes of this podcast I did with Just Ice. And I went up to his apartment. And he lives in Woodlawn. So that's like a completely north. That's like yeah, way yeah, north of yeah, all that, right? Yeah, yeah. Woodlawn, that's up by like 233rd. That's it's like, up there. Yeah, it's up the top of the Bronx. I took it. I took the train from here to oh, there. Yeah. It's like an hour and 45 minutes <laughs> on the subways. Get out of here. <laughs> it's fucking far as shit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's like the last stop it on is, the four train, yeah, I think. Something like that. Yeah, because my father had a, um, a house up there at one point. Um he lived in a, it was this place called the Valley, like it's up not far from Co-op City. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yeah, he, that's up up Bronx, up part of the Bronx, and that part of the Bronx, a lot of Caribbeans, because my mm. father's from St. Thomas, so okay. West Indian, so it was a lot of West Indians, Jamaicans, you know, Caribbean people live up in the north part of the Bronx. Mm. But growing up, I mean, those two are pretty different like would you even go to that part of the bronx growing up would you have any reason to no, go well we the, the reason when we was growing up we used to go near there was um the original skate key was on arlington skate Avenue. key skate key being like this hip-hop historic song, hip-hop yes, club like, yeah like, the skating rink exactly i've seen slick rick and dougie fresh do uh lottie dottie there Amazing, you know. So, we, what what year would you estimate I would that? Say that was like mid eighties. I've been going like maybe eighty. What eighty? Lottie Dotty came out 84, 85. Yeah. I want to say like eighty five or eighty six. Wow! Right so now. when it was like an actual new yeah, routine, exactly. Yes, it was new. So Skate Key was the. I forgot what train that was, but I say it was a four train or a two train. One of them stops. Mm-hmm. I haven't been on the train since high school. So. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so, 
no, no, correct, no, correction. I remember one year in the nineties, me and Drez, we had cars. We had we had just got our deals. We had bought some new cars. And he just had an idea. He just felt like getting on the train. Just for kicks. Let's go yeah, on the train. Yo, yo, we got on the train. We rolled down. Yes, I got on that train that time. And then recently, we just did a, uh, well, we were doing a, we're doing a uh, documentary on the Legion. And we got on the train. Dope. Okay. We got on the train. <laughs> so it's been two times yes. since the 80s that you've been on the train. <laughs> <laughs> when I got on the train, the thing was making all this noise. Making a beeping sounds and all that. I was like, yo, what the hell is that? I was like, yo, when the last time you've been on the train? <laughs> and I was like, I was shocked. Technology, you know, it, it was telling you when the train is coming. And right. all that. I was like, right. wow. Yeah, that, they didn't have that uh, back in the yeah, day. Yeah. Nah. <laughs> nah. So, yeah, we used to take the train to Arlington Avenue. And then under, re, part of the reason, too, why I started driving... I got. I bought my first car. I was in the twelfth grade, so mm. like my last year of school, I drove. I graduate. I'm an old. I'm an old guy. I gra- graduated in eighty seven, so my first car I bought. Um, eighty seven. I was driving and taking the bus or the train or whatever. I was doing both. Right. And then after that, I just was driving from that point. Right. I mean, that's kind of like somewhat rare for New York for a New York City native. Mm-hmm. I think outside of New York, that's just like the norm for yeah. if you're a senior yeah. in high school or whatever. Yeah. Like most people drive to school, but New York is such a different such a different thing. Yeah, every, yeah. every you know normal high you know high school you on the train you on the bus, right. and then, um, then my last year of high school, like things was changing around us, and I kind of got caught up in the change, so I was able to go and get a car and, right. you know, do certain things that the average 17-year-old might not have been able to do. Right, right, right. You know. So how much was going out, like, I mean, going back to Skate Key, because obviously during that period of time, um, whether you're, like, you know, pursuing to be, like, a recording artist, so to speak, if you're going out socializing and going to clubs and going to parties, which just was what was what kids did, yeah. like there's obviously some very like um, groundbreaking, uh, innovative shit going on in clubs in yes. the in uptown and in the Bronx yes, in yes. the early very, mid '80s and stuff. Very, so, very much so, how much do you like? How much of that played into just you as like you know when you're before being. 17, 18, 19, and being like a man, basically. But like, you know, as a as a kid, when you guys were in junior high school, middle school, yeah. like going out and all that, like what back, do you remember? Back then, I remember going, my, my uncle was cool with, um, what's it, Easy, Easy AD from Cold Crush. Uh-huh. So I remember, and that was, that was one thing that I, at my childhood, in the Bronx, back in the days, we had the parks. Of course. And we used to go out to the parks, and I used to see Cold Crush. I used to go to the Armory. They had an Armory in Harlem. I saw, um, what's the guy? Um, Soup, uh, Rhymes, Rhymes. I remember going to see that. That's not Spoonie G. I hope I don't mess that up. I said Spoonie G, but it was another guy. I remember he had on tight. Oh, man, Super, was it Super Rapping? Was it? I remember he, the song started, it was like, because I'm um, soup, 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 super, run, run. Right. Yeah. And he said he had on these, like, tight gray leather shorts. <laughs> and, right. you know, I was like, wow. As a kid, like, you seeing, you know, these rappers. And, like, I, back then, the, the the best and the dopest and the craziest was always, to me, was cold crushing them. Right. Melly Mel and them was bananas, too, you know, growing up seeing them. But, uh, but cold, you were cold a cold crush, crush yeah, yeah. I was... Grandmaster Kaz was like, you know, back then, he would be like a Jay Z. You know Absolutely, saying? yeah. You know, he was the man, and we would go to. It was a spot in the Bronx called the Dixie. I this might is a club. Yeah, uh, that's where they filmed Wild Style at. Right. And um, it's not far from Freeman Street. My cousin lived like right down the block from there, and um, the Dixies was used to be a Bronx spot. You know. Uh, um, Cold Crushing them used to rock in there. They filmed, like I said, they filmed Wild Style in there. And they, what was so dope about them, the routines, man. 
They used to harmonize right. in the routines with the, you know, we rock and shock the block, give it all we got. Cause we go right. we rock the spot, we cold crush. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> like, I remember all of that clear. Right, that's gotta be so, uh, that's gotta be so, imp- make such an impression yes, on it you. Did. Mm-hmm. Yes, it did. And it made, like, it was just like, you hear them, you see them up there performing, and, and, and the music is just echoing throughout the park. Right. And that was all the time. You know, where we lived, you know, they used to do parties, Soundview Park, Bronxdale Park, always Bronx River and Bronx River Center. Like, you're just all over the Bronx. Yeah, and the community centers yeah. too, right? Yeah. Was there a rivalry between um, between Soundview and and uh, and, Bron- and Bronxdale? I think, like, Is that it something you were even always, aware yeah, of as yeah, a kid? I think, I think as a kid... Because you got to understand, too, the 80s and the 90s, and I, and I could be wrong, but I believe, I always thought, because I, I used to read up about the history and demographics of New York City, and they, I always thought it was the 70s. They said the most violent year in New York City, I believe it was the early 90s. Oh, wow. Where, I, where our murder rate was extremely high. Right. Or they might have been averaging two, three murders a day, something like wow. that. Wow. And we were we were moving around in that element. You know sure. what I'm saying? And then and and the reason being I think because the the crack game came into play in the eighty seven. Right. And we were in the mix of running around, hanging out. A lot was going on in the rap game and a lot was going on in the streets. So it was just a whole uproar of violence. Mm. In the mix of the partying, right, the partying right. and the hanging out, going to the clubs, going to the rooftop. So for people that don't know the rooftop, obviously you have to kind of be like a New York native to really understand what that was. It, it was also oh, a club, yeah. but it yeah. was also a really influential club. And if I might even go further, I mean, it obviously plays a big part in the Legion, yes. too, because yes. it's all over yes. that oh, album, yes. too. <laughs> If you really pay attention yes, and kind of, if you listen to it enough, yes. the story really starts to open up a little bit more yeah. if you get the references too, you know, yes, like, yes, yes. so what was your first, do you remember any, oh, your first man. experiences going to the rooftop? I remember going there in the early, early eighties. I want to say my first time going there might've been like 84, 85. I was in high school and, uh, I believe they closed in 88. I, okay, I think so they closed around 88, right. but that run from 84 to 88, and they got a nice run, but it was it was a lot of drug dealers. Right. And you understand, back then, the, the, the drug dealers were the guys we looked up to. They was the guys with the cars, and it was a whole lot. It was a lot. I'm trying to see where I could even start. Uh Brucey e. B was the DJ there. Right, right. And that, I want to get to him, too, because yes. he plays a big part yes. in the story, the origin story of the Legion, I feel like. Yes, he, he went to jail. Like, he knew Brucey e. B was around street cats. And, you know, that whole element back in the 80s, it was, he was always around a street dude. At that time, you know, Alpo, you hear them stories, Alpo, Rich Porter, right. AZ, those guys was the men. And they were young at the time. They, they right. were young getting all, all his money and it's like I said when the crack started so Brucey e. B was the DJ in the rooftop and he used to put on a record at the time Bismarck was rocking so he would put on he would rock a biz record and he'll give shout outs like shout their names out right. we got my man Rich Rich in the house Alpo AZ Crusher Pookie like he just naming dudes from right. the streets and they're all in the house at that and moment they're all in the in the place like right. this was one place where all the drug dealers from Harlem came to hang out, and then you got started getting them from the Bronx and guys from Queens, because that's like Supreme Team. I, rem- right. I remember uh, Supreme Team, and they from Queens. I remember them dudes, they crew came in, and they had like these lightning bolts on the back of their jackets, like wow. Shazam. Like back in the days, like you came in and you, like your wardrobe, like the guy that was making the clothes for everybody back then was Dapper Dan. Right. Dapper Dan lived in Chuck's building. He lived in the building next to mine's. Interesting. And he used to come to the block. He had the MCM Red Wrangler Mm -hmm. with the MCM seats. 
So it was growing. Of course, we run it. Chuck's moms was cool with his girlfriend, so they had wow. all these Fendi jackets and all that. So you know, me and Chuck just got caught in it. Like all the street dudes is wearing it. He lives right. on, our, on our block, so we gotta go. You had access to yes, him. exactly. So we went. We got jackets done, and we had. I had. Did he do them? Well, he owns the place. He had people working. So I'm not going to say he did it himself, but it came from his store. Wow. Dapper Dan's on 125th Street on the, on the east side. And he did, you know, clothes for us. I, he did, uh, uh, my, I, had a tr- I had a Jeep back then. I'm going to say, like, it was 88 or 89. You know, I, me and Chuck, we kind of got caught in the mix. So we did what we did, and I was able to go buy a new truck. Took it to Dap. I was like, yo, do my truck for me. He, he, he did the cover on the back. I think my cover said something like rated this V6. Something you know, so on the wheel? On the back of the wheel right. with the big Gucci emblem in the middle. We teenagers, we feeling, we feeling it. And this is what was right. going on. You know, when you get a couple of dollars, that's what you did. You go get you a new car. Right. Go get you the Gucci. Go get you the jewelry. And we blend it in. Right. You know, so... Rooftop was a was a left an impact on me because around that time as I'm I'm around it I see it so I, I I'm a, I'm, a, I'm attracted to it I'm a, the Lord pulled me in and um, I'm a year older than Smash so I'm like his big brother so I pulled him with me so we around all of it we in there with all these guys and seeing these guys all the time. So, Are they taking? Or did someone take you under their wing? Nah, nobody. I wouldn't say nobody took me under the wing. I got cool with AZ later on. I met him like later. Like I would see him, but I didn't know him. You know, he's older than me. I'm like a little kid compared right. to him. So as we get older, men are all somewhat the same age. So I met him later on, and I remember him giving me a. Um, he had a project called. I think, well, the hat, it says silence on the front. It was red. It says silence, I think, on the back. It said mob style or one, three, two or something like that. But AZ had a group called Mob Style. Him, Gangsta Lou, Pretty Tone. Um, Yeah, so me, I met A a couple times. and and, um, Did you guys do music together? We didn't get a chance to. I definitely wanted to. Mm. Because at this time, I don't even know. Was we even out yet? But I know I, I we might have been just signing our deal or something like that because we signed like in '93. Because the Legion album is '94, 94, 94, basically. Right? Yeah, yeah. We we I think we signed in '93. But prior to that, I think Brucey e. B had just got out of jail. Because mind you, everything ended with the rooftop in like '88 or maybe '89. So did that leave? That obviously must have left some sort of gap in the scene. There's a gap, definitely right. a gap in the scene because we used to leave the rooftop. Everybody, you know, Alpo's on his bike, so he's in his Bronco. You know, everybody's in the streets just race. You know, on the corner was Blimpy's, so we used to go to Blimpy's, right. hang out on the corner. Mind you, rooftop is across the street from Rucker Park and across from Polo Grounds. So we would leave there, go to Blimpy's, or go up to Hunt 45th to Willy Burgers, mm. get a Willy Burger, and then up above Willy Burger, it was a club up in this building right there called the SNS Club. Hmm. Go there. Uh, I think across the street was another spot called the Zodiac Club. It was a lot of clubs and places to go hang out. But was there a particular night that Brucey e. B would be at the rooftop or would it be uh, like a Friday, Saturday I thing or would you a, do it on a Tuesday? I or what? Think How it was it? a Friday night, I think. Now that I can't say for sure, sure. but... I must I'm, maybe say it was a Friday or a Saturday. I'm not sure. As time went on, one place I do remember it was every Sunday the tunnel. Right. But rooftop, this is a few years that later. Was though, years right? later, that roof the tunnel was years later. But the rooftop, um, I don't remember exactly what day it was, but I was I was going in there from 14 to 17 and uh yeah i used to go i used to get in trouble with my mom because i would come in all wee hours of the night and she's right. like you can't be coming in here this time of night mm-hmm. but it was it was the place to be and it was that era scarface the movie came out there wow. was a lot of things that happened in that time span and it changed the dynamics of a young man's thought process and like i said it pulled you in to do certain things Cause like I said, I remember LL Cool J coming to the rooftop 
but the the guys that shine was the Alpole, right. um, J- Jason. Uh, there was a dude named L.A. L.A. was the the first. Like, really, he was like the first name I heard when I first started hanging out there. He got killed, and I think due to a lot of the violence at some point, because it was always somebody getting shot, somebody getting jumped some type of murder it was always something afterwards they not necessarily happen. inside not of the inside, club right? but right. outside up the street down the block around me, always right. something happened and I think due to a lot of events it, they end up having to close of course yeah, yeah. But I remember seeing Dougie Fresh perform there I remember seeing um oh this guy uh this guy from Brooklyn I forgot what record he made Oh, I was popping back then. It'll come to me, but yeah, I mean everybody back in the right. days performed in there. Bismarck, yeah, rooftop. I mean, it's it's an important club in yes. New York history. In you effect, know. it if it changed even Eric B and Rakim, right on the cover. I forgot what album they sitting on the car and they got the jackets on. It says Eric B and Rakim right on the back. Yeah. That's paid in full. Paid in full. That's right. it from Dapper Dan. And they, you know what I'm saying? Dapper Dan, the rooftop era, it affected everybody streetwise in music. Because like I said, right. LL, even down to Mike Tyson. Mike right. Tyson went to Dapper Dan to get right. his, his, his gear made. Actually, the night he punched Miss Green in the eye and all that, I was out there that night. Wow. But Dapper Dan's spot was kind of a hangout, too, because you would go really? there and you would see... Um, like Alpo had got the full length Louis Vuitton jacket with the hood with the fur done there. How much? I mean, how much is that running at that yeah, at that yeah. in those years? How that's got to that cost time, thousands yeah, of dollars. You, right? you would you could go in there and get a jacket, mind you, two three thousand for a jacket. Wow, that's a lot now. So yeah. back then, you this you, is like eighty five, eighty six. Yeah, yeah right? you talk. Yeah, like yeah, eighty six. You go and dropping thousands on a jacket, and I mean, dudes would go and and get it in flavors, right? You know, it was the crack epidemic started, everybody hustling, everybody getting money, everybody buying cars and shopping and, and running the Dapper Dan to get outfits made. Right. Not to go too far into that tangent, although I'm I'm obviously intrigued by it because it's, it's amazing stories. Yes. You know, it's a lot of, you know, terrible shit happened, too, in the midst yeah. of all that. But how much knowing that it was that era of time and that Alpo and Rich Porter are associated with hip hop so much because the you know, obviously their names been used in Pretty different sure. tracks and yeah. they and they and they mingled in the clubs with with uh, artists of that time and DJs were make you know, they were commissioned to make mixtapes specifically for some of those guys and yeah. stuff. How much was like you know, obviously Nikki Barnes and those and I think it's the commission or what the yeah. that group that's that's earlier. That's way earlier. Way earlier, yeah. but obviously yeah. that, that must play some role later. Or is it considered think, like are they considered like passe and old school by I think the, they might have been old school by the time Rich Porter and Al Paul and them was doing anything because you had the you had uh, uh, Bumpy that was probably like mm, the forties yeah. right and then right. after him the the maybe the next big generation of guys was like the you know maybe Frank Lucas and and Nicky Barnes and uh, Guy Fisher was from the Bronx right. you know they era came later and then. That Rich Porter era, like you got them, and then you got guys like Fritz and then Lou Sims. It was a lot of names out of heart. Right, right. Yeah, it's crazy too because when if you read like Don Diva magazine or if you re- watch, there's lots of movies and documentaries now, both fictionalized movies like mm-hmm. Paid in Full. But yeah. there's some amazing documentaries about that stuff and the parallels to how like I mean now I'm only speaking as an outsider only. But as like a true, I want to add to that what you give us what you said. I just thought about paying full. Dame, I want to say this, and then we go to what you said. Dame, Dame from Rock Rockefeller. Dame, Dame Dash. Dash. He right. did a great job with that movie. I love that movie. It's yeah, a great. It's a great it's, it's film. Close, right. It's close to a lot of it. You know, you had to change some storylines because right. Rich Porter, and at the time, we all floating around in the street. They kidnapped his brother Darnell. And they cut his finger off and and left it mm. in um, McDonald's on the 125th. Street. Wow! They didn't put that in the movie, but that's what happened. And and Rich, he was killed by Alpo, but it wasn't in those hallway stairs. Like they, he killed them and dumped his body in City Island. 
Right. So uh, for the sake of making a film, yeah, they yes, got to yeah. compromise some things exactly. a little bit. I, guess, I think the he only... Did a great, he did a great job. He represented that whole era right. great. Like, I don't think anybody did a... Or speaking of it, like, put it in a better form than what Dame Dash did. He did right. a great job. I think the only point I was really trying to make, too, is that those guys' characters were as larger than life as a yeah. Rakim, LL, yeah, Kane, and stuff. They were, you know, like neck and neck as yeah. far as notoriety, if not even more notorious they in were. New York City. You know, it's exactly. it's very much a New York City thing, yeah. though. You know, yeah. what? Um, Alpo's name rang from New York down to Virginia. Yeah, well, obviously, yeah, D.C. Coast. plays a yeah. very large yeah, role. He made his way down to D.C., and then once he got to D.C., the murder, the drugs, so his right. name rang down there. But I remember, yeah, we used to, Virginia Beach was a place we used to go to back in the day, and I remember we all was down there. He had the MPV out there. But, um, like, Rich Porter was a Harlem name. You know what I'm saying? His name rang out because everybody knew about him. Right. But he Out of everybody, he was a low-key type person. I'm not going to sit here and say I know him personally because, again, them guys was older than me. Right. I know his cousin, you know, Travis, that's my man. And um, Travis, if if Darnell was alive, him and Tra- Travis and Darnell was caught in this, the same age bracket. But um, I mean, you can only be so high profile if 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 that's your line of work too. Yeah. I mean, unless you'd like to be really high profile. Again, you know, I'm just I'm just a casual outsider, just just observing yeah, it all. Observing, you know, yeah. Yeah. and me too. Like I said, I was young and I observed like. That's like you you a kid, and like I said, back in them days, the drug dealer guys, they were the celebrities, you know, or you could see a, a, a number runner guy that had the big car with the jewelry on. He was the man. You know, it wasn't really, the rappers weren't, you know, the guys in, in our eyes. And the, the generation changed. These kids now follow what these rappers do. Right. They, what, if these rappers are rhyming about Kush, a drinking syrup, they want to do it. Right. Back in our day, you know, the hustler dudes were into doing drugs. If anything, they might have drunk champagne, but right. they was like, you know, the Scarface thing, never get high on your own supply, so right. they didn't do drugs. And the rappers, we grew up on Rakim and Public Enemy and Kara's one they didn't rhyme about using drugs and drinking right, and right. doing all that type of stuff. Right. Public Enemy was fight the power and KRS was you must learn you know it was right. different Rock Kim was everything you know Eric B for president my check out my melody right. like, the music was just totally different and the message was different yeah that shift is so crazy it how is. it's totally it reversed or something I don't even know if reverse is really yeah. even accurate but yeah. how much the musician pop star hip hop kind of artists of today mm-hmm. how much of a different kind of influence they have on the audience and how much people pay attention to them yeah. like um, I kind of and it's crazy you know I, I could I could sound off but my opinion you know it, it's, it's, this is their generation this is their music sure but far as somewhat the change and the culture of it I, I some of it I push towards the DJs because they they're the ones who play it right that's true they have an option to play Yo, this sounds good, this is hot, or they could go with the nursery noisy stuff, and they tend to play the nursery noisy stuff more than they want to play something that sounds hot. Right. What's interesting, too, is if, like, if you, you know, listen to stories of certain record, especially in New York, of records uh, um, from the mid to late 80s that are associated as, like, big classic hip-hop hits, and how back then they were, like, you know, uh, anthems to like rob someone in a club. Like there's certain like there was a Stetson Sonic song yeah, I remember. Stetson, come on, um, bang, the dun dun, bang bang. Yo, that record came on. Yo, Brooklyn dudes, that's another deal. Brooklyn dudes was everywhere. You couldn't go nowhere without a Brooklyn dude being there. Right. And that's the funny thing. I do remember Brooklyn dudes. They weren't aware of who was who when they came up to Harlem. Mm. Cause a lot of times, some of the violence, the beefs was with them. Cause they mm. wouldn't know who, yo, that's such and such. They don't know, they live, they all the way from Brooklyn. Right. But Harlem is a walk over the bridge from the Bronx, so Bronx and Harlem cats knew each other. 
Right. So they would come and maybe try to rob somebody not knowing that, yo, you, you tried to rob the man. Now you can't leave. Mm. So that's where it, the Brooklyn dudes was kind of, if any any robber, robbery or stick up, it, it would be the Brooklyn dudes. <laughs> right. But did, but you guys wouldn't come to clubs in Brooklyn, would you? Well, Just, you didn't need to, I right? I never, yo, because everything was popping. It was, from what we knew, it was nothing better than the rooftop. And right. then after the rooftop, it was the rink in New Jersey. Oh, wow, we yeah. We used to go to the rink, and that was, like, the next spot to go to. Other than that, it was always, you know, the rooftop. It was Skate Key. Then it was, you know, downtown spots. like. Um, Did you ever go to Union Square? Yeah, Union Square. That was Brooklyn's house. That right. was their house. That's close yeah. enough, right? Yeah, right. That, was, that was their house. Definitely their house. Uh, Latin Quarter, of course. Latin Quarter's. Union Square, those spots, anything downtown Brooklyn ran. Uptown, like, oh, I forgot we had the fever. The fever was rocking. Sure. Oh, and what's his name? Gungi. That mm-hmm. spot was rocking. But anything Did down- you ever go to Bonds International? That was like the Times Square Club. That might have been like kind of um, um, like early 80s. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. That one doesn't um, really, It's it was one of them, but doesn't get like really, it's not as famous as. Latin Quarter rooftop or yeah, um, I don't remember yeah, Bonds or maybe that was before my time. Yeah, I'm just fascinated with old with defunct New York City nightclubs yeah. and you know that's how you know when I was at the Knitting Factory we we did some work there together some shows and even that period of time in New York was for some turn of circumstances that was like the hip hop spot for a couple of years it okay. had its little moment of time where there there were other a few other venues in New York during that period of time in the, in the later 2000s you okay. know it was like 2000 six seven eight when i was there when it closed and not to jump ahead because there's a there's a bunch of stuff i want to cover while i have gotcha, you yeah. here but there's this i was um i was talking to my my girl about uh our conversation last night like i showed her some videos she was unfamiliar with the legion so i wanted to familiarize herself with who because i was excited about it. i'm like this is really cool i'm really looking forward to this and then i remembered how like you know, my last night at the club at the Knitting Factory, I had Rakim play, yeah. and a gang of other people, Legion, I think it was Consequence, and Black Thought, and yeah, Brand Black Nubian, Thought, yeah, and, yeah, and a gang of other people, uh, Just Ice, and yeah, uh, really. yeah, a group of folks. Um, and it was my last night at the club, so I wanted to have a big, yeah, you know, dope, showdown. Night, yeah. yeah, but near the end of the night, the, ba- the bouncer of the club, I went outside to, I think even just like smoke a cigarette. It was uh, oversold out, it was really packed, a lot of people in there i just want to take a breath of fresh air and um and i went outside and they had like this dude in a yoke on the ground and shit the the some of the other bouncer guys and uh, i had a buddy with me that was right behind me and i motioned to him like yo they're you know check this out they're kicking this dude's ass like haha you know like that you know they're fucking this guy i didn't know who they were i didn't know the gentleman at all i didn't know what happened but before i could turn my head back to the the activity on the sidewalk I get, you know, punched in the side of the face, sucker punched by the bouncer of the club. And um, I didn't fall down. I, I had to take a knee because the dude hit me straight I up. I think I remember that vaguely. Bro. Right. I think yeah. I did ask you, yo, you all right? Right. Yeah. And I was, and was I, like, I, I'm good. I'm good. I said, yo, you sure you all right? Because like, yeah. I didn't I didn't know what happened. I came in on the tail end of it. Right. Well, it was a shock because, you know, anytime I was looking the other direction, the dude straight sucker punched me. So... You know, my body was like it was loose. I wasn't ready to, you know. What the hell did he do that for? Um, I mean, without going into it, because I now I haven't seen him for years, and I'm not trying to. Uh, but I think he just wasn't a fan of me personally. Oh, okay. I think right. he, you know, since I was the guy that did all the hip hop shows, I know that he pre- in, earlier in that evening he asked if he could get on stage and rhyme, and I said, "Listen, man, it's a, you oh, know, he's a sucker, man. it was it's a, it's my last night, man, and it's I got rock him, and I have some actual like." Oh, I can't a, fit you in, and I'm sorry. He's a sucker for that. So he he took that opportunity to, to swing on me. But I remember, I remember, uh, you know, a little bit later on in the evening, because I had still had to get back to work. I did, you know, I was just trying to have a good time. Yeah. I didn't swing on anybody. I didn't do nothing. So, so I was, and a whole bunch of other shit happened after that too. But I ran into you guys and I explained it, and you were very cool you you were like let you know let me know if like what's going on yeah, if you need I had, help yeah if you needed uh, yo I, I met well, i met you i think that was the second time you had us there 
Yeah, because we did DITC before yeah, that. Exactly. And I liked your energy. And I'm like, this is a good dude. Like, what, why would somebody do that? So I had a couple of guys with me. So I was, that's why I asked you. I said, yo, right. Which, you all right? You want, is this something, you know, you need? I would have helped. Yeah, I appreciate and that. You said, yeah. nah, I'm good. Yeah, because then it would have, who knows what would have gone down, but I like a, a that would have been interesting in retrospect I kind of regret I should have we should have just like gone at it but uh, but I and it's so crazy because we we were in there I had dudes with me and then a couple of other guys I knew came right and they had dudes with them and then my man uh, Smiley the ghetto child he came it, it was we was in there deep so yeah and I had booked all the talent too yeah, I so, knew everybody else in the house too it's not like yeah, I so yeah. I wasn't the outnumbered one I don't he, think he you know. He would have been outnumbered. Yeah. But I didn't want But to. you were very diplomatic about it. Yeah, I didn't want to get in no fight, you know, and, like, see someone get stomped out on the, you yeah. know. But it was, it was fucked up, and even how the club dealt with it after, it was like everybody was pretty foul after, the following days after. So it was just a trip to make that. That was, like, my last night working there, too. But I always remember, and I was remembering uh, telling her about it last night, that, like, you guys have my back, and I really yeah. appreciate that, yeah. you know. Yeah. So I just wanted I, – I was just <laughs> thinking about our conversation. I was like, oh, shit. Like, I remember that, like, fucking Yo, I, night. I always had I'm, – I'm not going to say – let me let me say this correctly. I'm not going to say I had a problem with bouncers because I never really did because some of them were cool. But some of them take that, you know, oh, I'm big, you know – I'm big and these guys here with me. That don't mean nothing. It's b- right. bouncers that put their hands on the wrong people and end up getting shot. Yeah. And and, and all guys been like, oh, word, I, I, I've been around it. Oh, word, you put your hands on me, I'll be right back. Mm. And you come back with 10 dudes that ain't ready. Y'all, y'all, y'all bouncers, but y'all not ready. These is real street dudes. And they, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, let me put it the best way. You work here. You're here all the time. <laughs> right. I could come back here and stomp you out or shoot at you every week until right. I get tired of doing it. Mm, right. So that's why I should be like, yo, yeah, that's not smart. Like I said, some of them I know, and they cool dudes. They just like, hey, I'm here to work. I get paid, and that's it. Then there's some of them that want to be extra with it. Oh, because I'm big. Right. Your size don't mean nothing. Bullets, they, no. bullets of one size, they, hit, they fit anybody. Mm, that's, yeah, that's true, yeah. And uh, you never know. You never. You yeah. just simply don't know when, when you pick on somebody. I feel like it's, you know, I think that's anywhere in the world, that's really. Exactly. Yeah. I was exactly. going to say it's like a New York thing, but. That's anywhere. You know, yeah. Because the thing is, you know, we older. We would have been, say we was younger, right? And, and you had us at that show. And I'm 19, 20 years old. I would have made you show me who he was. Even mm-hmm. though you would have said, no, nah, I'm good, I'm good. I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, fuck that. Right. Where this nigga at? Right, and then he, it would have just it would just happened. He would have just ended up getting stomped out because you put your man your hands on this man and he ain't do nothing. Right, or we wouldn't have cared what you did. The fact that you cool with us, you getting stomped out because you he put his hands on you, and right, we talk right. about it later. Right, there's nothing you can do about it now or yeah in the you moment. Stomped out, but you know as you get older, you think and you try to yo. Know, I I watched a video, man. Dice pulled up a video. Of us, I'm in my 20s and we're talking. I was like, "Dag, man, my my thought process. I sounded ignorant. Like, mm. I not th- not to say I didn't care or I didn't value life, but my thought process was warped. Mm. And I don't know if it was because of. And now, mind you, I grew up in a, a good household. You know, I, it's no poverty, no drugs, no alcohol. I grew up with two great parents. Mm. Me and my sister, and um, I didn't go through any any dealing with any poverty. It's just that I was around the street element, and then on top of me getting shot, and and when you get shot at that moment, it's a, it, it brings a, a sort of dark element because it could make you feel the way. Mm. It's either gonna make you scared, or it's right. gonna make you a little bit angry or a little bit violent. And I'm not going to say I was violent, but I might have been a little angry. How old were you when that happened? Um, oh, man, maybe maybe 20. It was right before Black Sheep came out. So even before the Legion was a group that people this, knew of? And yeah, we was... That's the thing. The Legion was like a... We wasn't a gang. 
but it was a crew of us, and it was a lot of us, and we all grew up together. We was all from the same neighborhood. So we went somewhere, it's any given time, 20, 30 of us. And it was just like that. From when we go to Skate Key, it was, we never had a name. The name didn't come until later. Like we ended up doing a party. We started doing little parties and we never had a name for it. And it was like, you know, I know it's in the Bible. It might not be a good term, but I, I, it stuck in my head, the Legion for We Are Many. Mm. So I was like, all right. That's what it is. We the Legion. Doing parties as far as performing like, at a party? No, nah, like just you putting them on? Putting them on. Just, let's just have a party. Oh, cool. And okay. we started doing that. Because, again, you know, a couple of the dudes, you know, we in the street, we do what we do. Me and Smash were doing what we do. So we had a couple of dollars. So it was like we was always hanging out. And back then it was always a party. Oh, you know, rooftop. Uh, it was just so much going on, and every night it was something going on. So it was, we were just hanging out and partying all the time. So we was like, yo, let's just throw a party. So we threw a party, then we threw another party, and that's what we did. Um, around, I, I want to say I got shot. Black Sheep came out in 91, right? The, yeah, the debut album came out in 91, yeah. I think I got shot right before that, because I remember I was, I ended up healing up from that. And then around the time when Dres and them started, I just started touring, hanging out. Me and Dres hung out. And then I started touring with them. And then that's when I was like, the anger was subsiding. Because after it happened, it was like, oh, I got to find out who, where this came from, who did it. They getting clapped. And, you know, your, your mindset is just rampant. You know, revenge, revenge, revenge. And then... Um, so you I, didn't know the person? Nah, they... um. Jones Beach used to be the the, the, the hangout back in the right. days. That was another, you go out there and there's thousands of black kids just hanging out. So I want to say maybe it was like 1990. Yeah, I had I had bought a car. I, I was in high school in 87. And then I went and bought another car. It was a brand new truck. I bought that in like 89. The one with the Gucci thing and, 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 the, and stuff, right? So... I used to wear a lot of jewelry. I had the big chain, the watch, the big giant bracelet with the ring and all that. So a couple of us used to, with the jewelry, used to always jewelried up. So we were, um, and it's funny, Peter, this is the first time I'm even telling the story. Hmm. Um, I was having a conversation where I never told the story in a song or I never told the story in an interview. But yeah, now I'm thinking about yeah, I'm telling it now. So we go to Jones Beach. Is is usually this usually it would be a lot of us. We would go out there deep. And we didn't go out. We it wasn't a lot of us this day. Before at the time I used to always walk around with a gun on me. I used to have a gun on me all the time. And right before this particular day. I'm in my truck, and it's me, Smash, my cousin, Corio, and Smash Girl. Um, at the time, I think it was Dietra. She lived up the block from us. And we getting ready to drop her off. So they pulled me over. So I grabbed, I grabbed the gun, and I passed it to her. I'm not a lawyer, but from what I understand, New York City, a, a, a female cop supposed to search a female. Okay. I could be wrong. Right, right. Makes but sense. When they pulled up, it was a bunch, like, they had us get out the car or whatever. They searched the vehicle, and um, she had took the gun and stuck it in between her legs or whatever. So they called for backup. They was like, we need a, we need a, another, we need a female officer, whatever mm -hmm. the case, whatever they said. Right. So two, three more cars came. It was all guys. So they didn't search her. They just told her, leave her bag, and they took her purse, and they dumped it. And then they didn't find anything. And then once they realized it wasn't a female cop and they didn't see anything, they let us go. Wow. That night, because, you know, you get you go to the bookings, you get sent to Rikers, you get caught with it. But that's what we did. We always carried guns yeah. back then. It was, you know, it was a New York thing because New York was crazy at the time. And we would wear expensive things. So it was like if somebody come, like, 
uh, I brought, I had my mom mom ski coat at the time. It was like a thousand dollars. Sure. Yeah. I'm like, ain't nobody taking my coat. You come to get this coat and shoot you through this through the coat. Like it was. It, it goes back to the get situation when they tried to rob him on the train and he shot the guys from Webster Webster Projects. Like anything could happen in the Bronx at that time. So when we dropped her off, it was like I had like a like a, a epiphany. Like yo. Damn, you was gonna go to jail, all because you just carrying a gun. You know right. what I'm saying? And I didn't have no beef with anybody. You know, I knew guys in my neighborhood. I knew dudes in the Bronx. I, you know, not to say I'm well known all throughout the place, but I knew people in different places. So if I went to Webster, I knew dudes over there. I go to um, Forest Projects. I knew dudes over there. Wherever I went, I kind of knew somebody. So and I didn't have no issues. So I was like, why well, I'm running around with a gun? So I stopped carrying the gun. I want to say two days later is when I needed the gun because I mm. went to Jones Beach and we hanging out, had all the jewelry on, had big, big, big chain and all that. So the whole time, nobody's, I'm bumping into people I know out there. Hey, what's up, yo? You know, saying what's up to everybody. The night is fine. No issues. Nobody tried to rob me. Nothing happened until... I'm on my way back, and it's me, Ed, and my cousin Buddha, and my my missus sister, um, Joanne. So I'm dropping Joanne off, and my missus and my son is coming downstairs. So we outside, we chilling. Joanne gets out the car, she's leaving. So then this this my back is to the street. <laughs> Which I, that, that was a lesson I learned. You never do that. Like, so you're facing the I'm building facing, or something. Okay, my man Ed is, he's standing drinking a beer. This this is the street. I'm standing facing this way, talking to him. They don't even see what I have on. Ed has on jewelry. Right. My cousin them fell asleep in the back of the truck. The truck is double parked right there. So they. And see, this is nighttime, right? This is at night. This is probably eleven, twelve at night, something like that. Ed is standing there. He got his jewelry on. So I look, I'm, as I'm talking to him, I see his face. Like he made, he got this look on his face. I wish he would have made the face sooner, but he made it too late. By the time he made the face, they already made the U-turn and jumped out the car. And it was two guys and they had, they had guns in their hands. So when I turned around, it was like, oh, we got us a lick. He got jewels. He got jewels. Mm. So and my I had on more jewelry than Ed. So they put the gun on him. They like get the fuck down on the ground. So Ed is on the floor. I didn't want to get on the floor because I'm like these dudes ain't shooting me in the back or nothing like that. I, I, my mind is racing. He's like yo get the fuck down. I'm like nah man. I said just take the jewelry. You 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 good here? Take the jewelry. Be up out of here. And the dude was like yo fuck that. Give me the keys to the car. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, and my cousin's in the back sleep. Right. I'm like, yo, you being greedy, man. Just take the jewelry, man. You ain't getting the keys to the car. And he's like, and he put, he like, like went to poke the gun on my man's head. He's like, you hear what the fuck I just said? And then I went to charge him. So I went to charge him, and we, as I, as I grab him, and we getting ready to rock, rock, like wrestle on the ground. He's a little, little strong Spanish dude. He starts shooting, and as he shoot, as he's shooting, the bullets is ricocheting off the floor. I think one went directly in my leg, mm. and um, I think the other one hit off the ground and hit me in the uh, in the back of my thigh. But anyway, I got hit up here. I got hit here, and they end up taking the bullet out down here. So uh, I traveled down. Yeah, the bullet hit me back here. And it traveled so all on the back of your calf to like your to your yeah, ankle. Yeah, because they took the bullet out right there. Oh wow! Right. But you could see, you could see like where it went in. It went right, in right, right right there. So the bullet went down like that. Mm. The other one up here, it healed up real good because I think the bullet went in. So once they was able to take it out, stitch it, and it healed up. But this one, it traveled down and they took it out down here. So yeah, I jumped in the oh, car. Man. I ran off. Like I, he shot me, 
And um, the, it was the other guy that was standing there. He was nervous because I saw it in his face. Like back back then, and I think even to this day, you could look at a man in his face and tell if he's serious or he's going to do something violent. You know, you could tell somebody when they're scared. So the other guy saw it in his face. He was scared. The guy that I tackled, he wasn't scared. This is what he do, and this ain't the first time he he mm. was doing it. So that's this is in the street. This is outside the street. The street. This is on a hundred and forty first. My my okay. Um, my wife is from My Haven Projects. Back all right at that time, she's my girlfriend. She's from My Haven Projects, and she grew up there. And she's Puerto Rican, and is Mount Haven, is Mitchell up the street, is Patterson. So it's that whole area is predominantly, it's just full of, it's a whole bunch of projects. And it's all Puerto Ricans and blacks. And it's so weird. As I'm dating her, I, used to, I come through, the Puerto Rican dudes used to look at me like, yo, who's this Cocolo? Who's this Moneno coming mm. to see her? But it was never a problem. I never had a problem with them. Like, for whatever, they respected me. And then the dudes that was whatever it was one or two Spanish dudes in the mo- in the building that was getting money, they recognized like okay he's doing the same thing I'm doing so it was cool I never had no problems, but these dudes I don't know if they were fun. like even in that er- area like it's like St. Anne's, um, Boy George is from the area he's another big right. name he did the Tango and Cash and had that whole area on lock so it. It, it was a lot going on in all those blocks. It was a lot of... It's so crazy. Even the song Rest in Peace, I'm telling that story as I'm coming back to her house. Another, um, This is later on. One of my good friends, he got killed right up the block. Like, the whole mm. area is pretty much violent. So, um, I knew he was serious, and I knew he was going to squeeze the gun. That's what made me charge at him and... When 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 I charged at him and I was hit, I think I fell on the I fell on the floor and he did, he just ran off. He grabbed the jewelry and he ran off and jumped in the car. Jesus, really? So I chased him. I jumped right. in my car and my truck and I'm chasing him. Now I'm angry. I don't even realize I'm hit. So really, my man is like, "Yo, you bleeding?" He's like, "Yo, bleeding, son. Yo, we gotta go to the hospital." My cousin wakes up. He's in the back seat. And I drive to Lincoln Hospital. It was so crazy. My son was born there. At, mm. at the time, I, as she's come, I'm waiting for her to come downstairs. My son might have been like one years old or two years old. Wow. So it wasn't that long after yeah. he had been born in that yeah. same hospital. Exactly. So I drive to Lincoln Hospital. By the time I get there, I'm just angry. Like, and um, I'm now I'm feeling the pain because I couldn't walk. Like they had to help me hop inside. So when I got inside. They didn't really know where I was hit because they, um, which they told me later, they said you didn't bleed a lot because you were calm for whatever reason. Mm. Because they said a lot of our patients that come in, their heart races in the blood and you bleed a lot. Right. You're panicking. Your heart rates up, so the blood is pumping. I wasn't panicking. I was just. I I remember me being angry, and that's why I wasn't a lot of blood. So they they had to. I had these red champion sweatpants on. They ripped up because they was trying to see where I was hit. So they started cutting up the right. pants to see where. But the doctor said, "Yo, you didn't, you didn't bleed a lot." He was like, "You're the one." He said, "You're one of the people that I've seen shot that's just kind of calm. You're very calm." Wow. And I said, "Yo, I'm fucking mad." <laughs> 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 and he said, "No, nah, oh, you know, pa- people come in from gunshot wounds and they panic." Yeah. You know, afterwards, after he talked, I think to that's him, the go-to yeah, reaction: yeah. total panic if yeah. you got shot. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I never I'm assuming. Yeah, I believe it is because I. It was a guy that came in after me, and he was shot. Matter of fact, it was maybe two or three people came in Lincoln Hospital, which I learned. You you don't want to go to a hospital where they're not used to these type of incidents. You don't, you go to a hospital and they're not used to a gunshot. They might not handle you the way like Lincoln Hospital. They're used to it, so right. Sadat even had. There's a lyric in one of Sadat's Sadat X's songs that references Lincoln Hospital. Is like a, exactly you know. that's a that's in the heart of all those projects. So they're used to violence. Oh, he got stabbed. Put him in there. Or oh, he shot. Put him in there. I know. You know they know how to handle. You go to 
I'm not gonna say Martin Fury Hospital is not familiar with it, but sure. they're gonna handle you different than Lincoln Hospital. They they used to people coming in there shot. Mm. So, yeah, that was that wow. was the story of me getting shot. And he just ran off, took he off, ran, and he took off. I'm following him, and I think, yeah, at once once Ed said you bleed, and I ended up busting the right. I think I made the right on 141st, and you pa- I forgot what precinct that is. I flew past the precinct. I was just running through the lights, and I raced to Lincoln Hospital. Wow. Lincoln Hospital is right across the street from Patterson Project. That's where AG is from. Right. Party, Artie, uh, D-Flo, they from Patterson. Right. Wow. Well, I mean, it sounds like uh, so many different, if one little thing was different in, in, in many different moments of that whole scenario, like we probably couldn't even be sitting here yeah, right now, or the Legion exactly. might not have existed as well, or you'd be in a chair or something like that. Because the bullet could have, the one that ricocheted that hit me in the back of the leg, that could have hit me anywhere. Yeah, man. Yeah. Jesus And Christ. on top of it, to make it even worse, this dude had a dirty gun because my leg got infected. They said he had a dirty bullet, dirty gun, whatever. The dirty case. meaning what? Rusted out or yeah, something? Like, like, like the bullet. You could get shot and they take a bullet out, and you'll heal. They, they hit me, and the bullet caused my leg to get infected. Mm. Not the upper bullet, not this, not not up here, but down here. This whole thing was infected. It had got gangrene. It had wow. a smell. Damn. And they were talking about cutting my leg off from the knee. Damn. Holy shit! Okay. So, at, at after my father, um, the once baseball was done, my father ended up getting a real good job. Um, he was a manager for a health insurance company. Um, it was called GHI back in the, in the, back then, and um, he was the man. He knew the president. He knew the guy. He my father played. He was the pitcher for the um, company's baseball team right so he was the man in there so he was like what and he m- made some calls to some certain people in the, in the company that knew certain doctors they found a doctor on park avenue and my father said go see him i went to him and that doctor healed me up he it was all in the in the drugs they needed to give me they was with lincoln hospital referred after the gunshot they referred me somewhere else and they didn't right. know, they didn't give me the right things to heal and my father right. sent me to the park avenue doctor and everything healed up amazing it's incredible how like uh you can go to one hospital and up to a certain point they can't help you for shit exactly. and then you have to go to you know you know since i haven't seen you in a while you know i went through a big traumatic thing too where my kidneys failed and yeah, yeah. yeah i had a transplant and everything i was on dialysis for a year Stop as well playing. and i yeah i'm not it's it's a, i don't want to get into it too much right now because i want to talk about <laughs> okay. your life but I went into the emergency room of Beth Israel over by Union Square on the mm-hmm. downtown, sort of. Uh, and I was there for three weeks. I was in ICU for a week. And I got that place fucking sucked. Although wow. the, a couple people there were angels. The nurses were incredible. And particularly, this, there was a few nurses in an ICU. But there were certain elements about it where I got pneumonia when I was there. Like, there was avoidable things. That place is it's just a janky ass hospital. I'm sorry if you work there and you're listening. <laughs> Although there's certain the nephrologist there, I really like a lot and whatever. But I ended up having my transplant at New York Presbyterian Well Cornell on the Upper East Side, and wow. they're like two different universes. So I understand and I empathize with you. Although our experiences are completely different, and I can't imagine the trauma of going not only getting shot and being able to get yourself to the hospital. But then the the aftermath, which no one, you know, people talk about being shot and it's glamorized in Hollywood movies and in certain music and stuff. But all the shit that happens afterwards, you know, yeah. like no one yeah. ever talks about that. No mm-hmm. one talks about the infections, exactly. the, the, you can't, the, all the things that happen that are with you for the rest of your life, exactly. you know, anyway. So, well, that's an incredible story though. Yeah, um, and, I, and the funny thing, like when we was doing the music, I never thought of telling that story. Like, you know, I, it's like, it's like as, as of now, like maybe some of the music I do now, I might tell a tale of what went on back then. But back then when we was doing a Legion album, I didn't talk about none of that. I just right. was straight, just hip hop. I didn't talk about none of the street stuff me and Smash did or me getting shot or any of that. I didn't talk about Yeah, it. which is a trip because having listened 
to this to the um, Legion album, uh, theme plus echo equals krill. Yeah. Is that how you would yeah. say it yeah. equals? Yeah, mm-hmm. theme. Yeah, because I was always said theme was the sound, the echo was our voices, and the and it equals the outcome is krill. It's just crazy, crazy hell, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, is that it's not like knowing you know the environment in which you possibly have made it in or the times of that of that that you were coming out of that particular era perhaps if that might be the right way to describe it coming out of that era because i mean obviously this like maybe five years after being shot or going through a lot of that stuff the the record was you know it's a it's it's a deep there's it's a great it's a concept album. It's very conceptual, yeah. Yeah. and I think it was maybe a little misunderstood when it first came out yeah. too. Because yeah. I famously, I remember the source like giving a terrible rating. Yeah, to I remember the, the guy who gave us the review. What's his name? Cheo something. No, that, isn't that the guy that that wrote Luke Cage? I think that's the same. It might be. I'm, I don't want. I don't want to. I don't want to say the wrong. Black thing. dude from Oakland. He's from California. I remember that, and he, he did. He gave us like a bad write up. And I don't know if I got a chance to speak to him or I talked to... I know I was venting to somebody. And it might have been somebody from the label. And my thing was, I was like, he doesn't he doesn't get it. He doesn't... I said, why wouldn't y'all give our album to somebody that's from New York and that understands? I said, if you'd have gave it to a writer that was, I don't know, worked at the source and hung out and went to Latin quarters or went to the rooftop. Like they would have, anybody from that era right. would have understood like, oh shit, this guy got, one, we it, it wasn't, besides the rooftop skits, cause I got the, yo, Brucey B, when he got out of jail, he gave me tapes. Cause I told him what we was doing. He gave me tapes, I took excerpts and played That's where those are from? From his tapes, straight from the rooftop. And I had him in the booth. He came to the studio, it wasn't no, I'm gonna email you the file. He came to, we were recording at Calliope Studios. That's where Dayla, that's where Whole Native Tongue was doing everything there. Uh, he came to Calliope and he recorded his, I had him on, I like the way it's going down. Which is, that's gotta be my favorite song on the album. That's the one I keep <laughs> going back to uh, over and over, not yeah. to interrupt you, but yeah. that intro too is just yeah. so, it's just, it's such a, I just, it's such a great song. Yeah, you know? thanks man. Yeah, yeah he, he, he did that. He did this, the, Buddha break, right. like he's on, he's there, and he's like Bruce is a cool dude. That's he's like, yo, man, cues whatever you want, man. I'm here, let's, let's rock out. His presence is like it's yeah. all over the record, yes. but it makes it feel like it's from like that roof. It's from the rooftop or yes. it's from that and, era. And I, and I had a conversation years ago, I think with somebody on my block, and I was like, I'm not saying we was the first one to do an album like a mixtape, but I mm. said. Everybody's and at this time everybody's mixtape crazy. I said when I recorded my album, it was almost in the form of a mixtape. Yeah, I mean it has. Yeah, I mean there's all types of uh, the the sketches and the sort of skits yeah. that 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 exist between the the actual songs. Yeah. It's like it has it's coming from that party vibe too. So yeah. it has that feeling because it was like mixtapes. You all you would hear Clue, you would hear whoever talking over the song, right. the echo. Bruce, we had that on our album, and that was right. in '94. Right, right. And his routines too. Some of the actual where he's sort of doing his own routine, vocalizing yeah, the yeah. sort of semi singing stuff is just yeah. so unique. Yeah. Now, listening to it now, yeah, yeah. Bruce, Bruce was the man, and he's still rocking to this day. He's a amazing. He's a, a well known DJ. He DJs a lot of places, but yeah, yeah, man, New York legend for yeah, sure. Definitely New York legend. New York legend. You cannot talk about the rooftop and don't say his name. Him, uh, the guy Cisco, he used to take our pictures. Mm. Uh, the pictures from inside the album, yeah, like those, yeah, yeah. The they're at, those are usually shot in the club, right? Inside and there's a the backdrop. Club, yeah, sure. and, and yeah, Cisco would take pictures. And um, he all them pictures from back, the pictures with uh, Rich Porter and all that, those that were taken in, in the rooftop. Cisco took those pictures. Wow. Yeah. Is he still around? I haven't seen him in years. He I ran, to put a, the there needs time, to be a book of yo, that He stuff. could, oh my gosh, that's a great idea. He definitely could do that. You know, I ran into him years ago in the tunnel. That's the last mm. time I've seen him. Was he, he was taking pictures there? I don't remember if he was taking pictures or not, 
But I remember that's the last time I saw him. I think wow. it was a tunnel era. Because those photos, because you see them from other, even I think on Showbiz and AG, on Runaway Slave, I think yeah. they have some in the back. Yeah. Like it's the DITC stuff, Bronx artists in particular have those those yeah. flicks. Yeah, because we can't, that's what we, you know, we came from that. I remember the Fed magazine came out and the first picture on the cover is like Von Zip, Alpo, AZ, Rich Porter, um, uh, Scott, which is crazy. Uh, uh, Scott is CeeLo's grand CeeLo's son. Scott is his grandfather. He's he he was he went he went and he did a bit. He's home too, and wow. we we friends to this day. He's a good guy, but yeah, he he's on the cover of that Fed magazine too. And they took, I believe that that was a, a Cisco picture. Wow. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about, too, uh, is the connection um, between, obviously, there's these, you have a couple of groups that, that sort of make up this network around uh, the Legion. You got Showbiz and AG and Black Sheep yes. and Chi Ali. Yes. Um, and I went back after listening to the Legion album like 15 times in a row, um, <laughs> which actually was a great experience. It was good. I, I know I've said that a couple times already, but I went back to Runaway Slave, which obviously is a, a, a hip hop classic, hands down. Yeah, it's an yeah. incredible album. Yeah. I love Showbiz and AG. Yeah, I love yeah. the DITC. Yeah, I love Goodfellas. I thought that was an incredible was record incredible too. Album, yeah. yeah. But Runaway Slave, the title track, the, I didn't. I totally slept on it until I yeah. listened to it again. But that's that you. Yeah. That's the intro yeah. of yeah. the Legion, right? Exactly. Is that the first time you guys are yeah. on anything? That was the first time we got on anything because I know it's so crazy. Like, okay, Showbiz, me and him, we're we're, we're friends. Like, we're his son and my son grew up together. Mm. And um, actually, um, if they do it right, it's a picture of my son, I want to say he might be seven years old, a birthday party. It's his son and right. my son and me and Show standing behind them. Dope. And then there's a current picture of the same, we're standing in the same position now. Wow. And I'm telling um, Fat Beats, you know, I want that on the cover, like, on the, I mean, on the back, you know. Right. How old's your son now? Oh, man. Uh, he's 28. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Him, him and Show Son, um, Show Son's name is Mel, and my son's name is Marv, and they nice. both they both twenty eight now. Wow! And so me and Show, we go back. So the music when when they did Runaway Slave, Show was like they were recording. I think that's Battery Studios in Queens. Uh -huh. Show was like, "Yo, man, I want you to come and, and do a, a skit or something." I said, "I bet, let's do it." And that's around the time when we was getting. I think we had just signed or we was about to sign. But, um, yeah, you, that demographic, even Chi, like Chi's a ma major part. I, w I definitely want to speak on him. Yeah, absolutely. Because he's, he's on the Legion album. Yes. And he, obviously, the connection to Chi Ali and Drez and Black yes. Sheep is she just as distinct. Did, it's so weird. Me and Drez went to the same elementary school in Queens, but we didn't know each other. Oh, no way. Drez, I mean, she introduced me to Drez. Oh, wow. At what point did... Um, okay, let me, let, me, let me go back a little bit. Okay, my father and she's mother go back maybe 40 years. Like, they known each wow. other for a long time. And uh, they ended up working together. And... They work together. So, Chi's brother, his name is Ray. That was my, me and him is friends. Me and Ray grew up together. So, as we're teenagers, we get older. Let me see. Was we teenagers or about to go out of our teens? Ray got caught in a situation where he had to go sit for a while. So, when he went to go do his time, she was little, so yeah, he's, like, he's younger than you, yeah, right? Way, yeah, he's younger than me. So I was like, Yeah, you know, why you going? I'm gonna hold baby bro down, I'm gonna look out, make sure he all right, you know. So Chi would hang with me, you know, he'd come hang with me, and um, I would get into certain things where I felt like I can't, you can't come with me right now, 
Right, you're not and old then, enough to yeah, hang so out in this would, situation. Exactly. So I remember I would drop him with Smash younger brother Rollo. Okay. Rollo and Cheese the same age, and they gotcha. and they end up growing up together. So yeah, I would bring Cheese to Rucker Park. I would I'd just take him out with me, He'd hang out with me, and it was so crazy. Chris Lighty. I lived on, me and Chris Lighty, well, Chris is from uptown, but he ended up moving on my block. We lived, we both lived wow. in Boynton. He lived in the building facing my building. But we went to the same high school. Oh, no way. All right. Yeah. In me, the same grade or no? We're in the same grade. Me and Chris the same age. Um, may he rest in peace. But mm -hmm. me, Chris, and Tim Dog, we went to Gompers High School. Wow. That's 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 pretty epic hip hop yeah, right there. Yeah, and Tim, that's my that was my man too. Tim was he was funny. Tim was like a comedian. Nothing, and, yeah, t no one, no artist was ever like Tim Dog. Nah, I'm a big Tim Dog yeah, fan too. Man. Straight up, that was that was my dude. And yeah, me, me, Chris, Tim Dog, we went to Gompers together. Now, and Chris used to run with this dude Daryl. He went to Gompers too. So Chris. I forgot how he met Chi. I totally forgot. But it was like, oh, you know Chi? I said, yeah, that's my family. So then that's when I would be like, yo, Chris, yo, you know, try to, you know, because Chris was running with the Jungle Brothers. Right. and Violators. Vi right? he viol it just started, and he was, and that's when he grabbed up Chi, and he started, I think he took Chi to Relativity or something like that. He right. did something. Chris was the reason why Chi got the deal. But we all was in in the same circles. Like I said, me and Chris went to school together. Chris, matter of fact, it's so crazy, small world. Chris's cousin, his name is Brian. Brian lived across from me. Brian moved out, and Chris ended up taking his apartment. And wow. Chris lived in the building facing mine. And, um, yeah, me and Chris was always cool from high school on into you know we would bump into each other in in the industry right real quick can you clarify because i think there's been some mysticism in hip-hop lure about the violators and stuff was that just like in the in the in the early days was it an actual group of people it I wasn't it a was, recording was, group it was it wasn't it? a recording group it, it was, was a like crew chris, of guys yeah it was a crew of dudes that chris ran with and they're from gotcha. uptown right, they, cool. uptown dudes from the bronx and then they, you know, like any group of guys, you end up putting a name on yourself. Yeah, it's just like your group of friends. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And they call themselves the Violators. And they used to run, hang out in spots. They used to be, they, they weren't, I never, I know them, but I don't know, of, I've never ran into them in the rooftop or anything like right. that. But they were guys that would be in like uh, um, Union Square. They was hanging right. out at all the hip hop spots. Right, right. They got and, so many shout outs and yeah, songs. They but, was everywhere. They right. was everywhere. And and then plus, you know, Red Alert, um, was that was he Sammy B's? No, not Sammy B. Um yeah, well, to it Mike was G. To Mike G. Mike yeah. G. He's, so Jungle Brothers, Mike yeah. G, Sammy B in yeah. Africa. Yeah, he's Mike G's uncle. And matter of fact, I think it was yeah. Everybody was pulling everybody in because Red Alert was the one who pulled Black Sheep in. Oh, okay. Mr. Yeah. Long. He, right. he met he met Long. I forgot how he met Long, but he pulled them in. And oh, back, and I'm, I'm all over the place. So back to Chi. So while Ray's away, Chi's running with me. So me and Chi's all we were together all the time, real all the time. So then, Drez and them got their deal. And we used to go to Drez crib. Right. Drez had Drez was living somewhere uptown in the Bronx, not far from Fordham Road. Right. And we would go up to Dred's crib, and then me and Dred's ended up hanging out. And then um, I remember, yeah, I was there from the beginning when when the album dropped. Yeah, around the time when the album was about to drop, I was there from the beginning. For Black Sheep. Yeah, for Black yeah. Sheep. And then, yeah, of course we was there for Chi. And everybody was everybody was coming out at the same time. Showbiz. Uh, yeah, Showbiz and AG was dropping, Chi Ali, Black Sheep, and then the whole Native Tongue, and then somewhere after right. that, that's when our album came Right, out. right, yeah. It's interesting, yeah, like, because as I was kind of listening to the records, yeah, it's really that, that Black Sheep is in 91, and then, you know, I think Showbiz was 92, Yeah. Yep. and then I think Chi Ali was like, yeah, and, and then Legion was, was there, yeah. and so many other amazing, yeah. other New York hip-hop records were coming out simultaneously, yeah. too, but... 
Yeah. And, and then it's like, but that was like the family unit right, right there. You just said it. Showbiz and AG, Chi Ali, the Legion, Black Sheep. Right. Everybody else was family too because we were cool with Tribe and Jungle and right. extended uh, brand new beers, nice and smooth. Greg Nice is a very close friend of mine, so yeah. me and him go back. I love Greg. Yeah, yeah. Greg is my dude. So, yeah, back then everybody was all, you know, tight with each other. We, we know we all came up. I have so many stories with so many different people. I'm sure. But yeah. Now the record and even the subsequent records after that it says produced by the Legion, but I have, did I have a feeling was that was that solely you yeah. doing the production? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what can you just break that down a little bit because um, there's never really been much of an explanation about you as a producer yeah. and I feel like you did other production work for people too yeah. later as well. Yeah, right. Um what it was is like I was I was so into just okay when Drez first it's so crazy when Drez first came to me right I he wanted me to do a solo project and then at one point he wanted me and Smiley to do a project together mm, so right. what it was I used to be on the road with Drez and doing road management work and stuff like that and then one day we were doing a show somewhere again Black Sheep traveled they went everywhere when Choices Yours came out. We was everywhere. Huge, huge record. Huge record. We were everywhere. Dresden them did Arsenio Hall. They, everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And you were rolling with them for the most part? I was with them everywhere they went. Uh, that's exciting. So, we, um, we, would, we would be at a show. I forgot which show it was. And Dres was like, I don't know if he put me on the spot or he asked me, but he was like, you'll come out and spit, spit, spit something. Oh, and I wasn't into really, I really didn't, wasn't into rapping. My thing was the, the beats, the DJing, because even back in the beginning, I was the DJ and Smash was the rapper. Gotcha. And we used to, this is something me and him used to do. Uh, before we used to go to the rooftop, this was like, say, 86. Me and him would be in the house, in his crib. I had, I, I had, and that's that's the thing. I had equipment at everybody's crib. I had equipment in, at my house, my, my mom's crib, Smash mom's crib, uh, another guy upstairs, um, G Rod. I had equipment in his crib. Really? So just satellite I had, I, studios. You know, I had turntables everywhere. <laughs> like to this day, man, I probably got about six, eight turntables in my basement. <laughs> wow. I had equipment everywhere. So we'd be up in Smash crib. I'm we DJing. He's rapping. And then we would put that down for a minute and calm our and, and calm ourselves down. I don't know why. It wasn't planned, but we would DJ, the music's loud, I'm scratching. We would stop and then sit at the table and play chess for a little bit. Wow. <laughs> That's <laughs> we, amazing. We would, That's some discipline right there. <laughs> yeah. We would play chess, calm ourselves down, the house is quiet, because you know we you, you chess you gotta think. Right. And then it would get to the point where nobody's winning. The game is very close and we would leave it and then go get in the truck or whatever and go to the rooftop. <laughs> oh, wow. And then That's tight. Some, like, sometimes we would come back to the game the next day but right. or we would just do the rooftop, talk about that all, how the night went down, who was there, what girls was there, you know. So you guys were super tight. Yeah, me and time. Smash to this day, like, that is my brother. Like, people thought he was my brother. Like they mm. thought him and Rollo was my little brothers because we were been running. I'm 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 47. Smash is 46. We've been running with each other since the sixth, seventh grade. That's amazing. That's how, seventh grade, you were 11 or something like right. that. 12. It's <laughs> a good run. <laughs> yeah. So, so then where? Not to interrupt, but then where does the dice man? Okay, dice sense? dice came. Later, like, as we're finishing high school, Dice okay. came. And Dice didn't do the rooftop with us because the rooftop was definitely always me and Smash. And then it'd be a whole bunch of other guys. It'd be me, Smash, my man Barkley, Ty, Troy, Dave, my cousin Boo. There was a bunch of us. And then as the rooftop was dying out, it was closing or getting ready to close, whatever the case we started going to the rink, and CeeLo would go to the rink with us. Gotcha. And um, from that point, CeeLo was with us from that point. And the thing was, um, I was talking about the solo thing. I would go out on the stage with Drez and do a freestyle, and the crowd would react good, right? Like I'd get a good response. So we're on a 
so we on tour with Ice Cube. And um, amazing. So it's, yeah, this, this is when, during America's Most Wanted. Yeah, probably. Ice Cube just left N.W.A. He's on his solo, and he wanted he wanted Black Sheep on his tour. That's so so we on tour. Ice Cube is a mad cool dude to him. Uh, the Lynch Mob, Lynch Mob was on the tour. Uh, Coolio and um, was it WC in the Mad WC Circle? WC in the Mad uh, Circle. And you heard that DJ and Crazy Tunes just yeah. passed too. Get out of here! Yeah, yeah, a couple of days ago. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Sad. I, I'm a huge WC in the Mad Circle fan as well. Wow. Yeah. So you must have known him. Or, yeah, you know, I, I, I was cool with Dub. Like yeah. I used to, because matter of fact, Dub C and Coolio was together. Right. Yeah, they were together because they used to go out on stage and perform together. Right. So me and me and Dub, Dub C, we was cool. So, um, okay, yeah. So we doing that. Sh- we on that tour, and I think we do the Apollo. I think we're doing the Apollo. So it's all these guys freestyling on stage. It's Biz, Tretch, Smooth B. Wow. It's like a hodgepodge of rappers from that era on stage performing. I'm the only one that nobody knows. Hmm. And Dress brings me out. And I'm at the time, you know, I'm I'm s- straight off the off my street thing. I had I had just got shot. I'm healing up and whatever. I'm getting myself together, but I'm still like kinda in my element. So I'm fr- I got my Mark Buchanan and Pele Pele jacket on. Right. So I, I I didn't look like the average rapper. Like I look <laughs> like like a like a street dude or whatever. Cause at the time, at that time, rappers was what the dirty look like. Right. I don't want to call them dirty, but that's how you know <clears throat> rappers was with the bandanas and the ball heads and the Carhartt uh, jackets. Yeah, and Carhartt. Shit. Everybody just wanted to look hard and, right. and rough. And I was like, Nah, I'm on my fly guy shit. Right. I'm coming out there, fresh Tim's on the Mark Buchanan, and Dres gave me the mic, and it was a lot of industry people there. Um, Lisa Cortez and somebody else from Mercury was there. So after I spit and I got that got the good response, everybody was feeling me. The next day or the day after that, they was like, Yo, Dress, who's that guy you brought out? Mm. And um they was then Dress came back to me and was like, Yo, man, they wanna mess with you, man. They looking they wanna do a deal with you. Wow. And I'm off like, the strength of that. Yeah. And I was like they no they well they wanted to do something with me but they wanted me to do a put a demo together. Gotcha. And I was like I'm really not a rapper man you know right. what I'm saying I, I I like I'm a DJ I like to do beats I was like I said do, I do got a group though you know what I'm saying I got a crew and at the time it was a lot of guys around me like it was Smash was automatically immediately right gonna be you know he obviously was rhyming too at that time yeah CeeLo was rhyming Droop. It was Droop. Droop is on the Legion album. Yeah. Um, who else was around us? Uh, CME, E Dub. Uh, CME was also produced some stuff on the record. Yeah, he right? did. He did um, Legion Groove with me. Yeah. So, right. So, CME. That's my man. He, me and him. We were the DJs of the of the crew, but he also could, he could rap too. So it was a gang of us. We in the staircase, and I'm like, Yo, listen, man. I'm thinking of putting a group together. There's too many. And at the time, there was no Wu-Tang. There wasn't no nine, ten guys rapping. Right. I said, look, I'm going to put a group together. And I said, it's going to be me and two other people. That's what I'm thinking, three guys. I said, I who the three are, I'm not sure, but it's going to be three guys. And I said, off the off of my head, it's going to be me, Smash, and somebody else. So I wasn't sure if it was going to be g Rod because g Rod used to rap with us a lot. I wasn't sure if it was going to be Pat. I didn't know who. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna go with CeeLo. I said I like CeeLo. He I, he he got a look. He spits, and our chemistry is good. So then, I told Drez, and Drez was like, "Yo, you sure? You don't want to do the solo, or or you on Smiley? Because he had this vision with me and Smiley, the ghetto child. Right. But more of me. He he wanted me to do the solo. I will say that. Drez. You and Smiley as a duo, that'd be like a totally different dynamic than the Legion. You know, it'd be pretty. I mean, you both kind of have that a similar energy, yeah, yeah. you know, like it'd be a little more aggressive. That's yeah, for sure. Yeah, I definitely. feel like and smile. And that's a, he's another one. Smiley is like family too. Like Dope. his mother lives. I, I live in PA. His mother lives like 
two minutes up the street from me. Oh, no way. Right. And Smiley, he's another one. I go back years with him. You know, him and Melaka. I've I known them guys for years. So group so, home. Yeah, yeah, group home, exactly. And Smiley's like a little brother. So back to the, to the Legion thing, Dred, I said, Dred, this is, this is going to be the group. So we went in the studio with Calliope, and we recorded like two, three songs for a demo. Took it to them, and they was like, bet. We want we want to do it. I didn't like the demo. Matter of fact, I didn't even do the beats. I think Long did, did the beats. Okay, so but it was like I don't I don't want to say it was rushed or anything like that. But it was like we have to do a demo. So you're in a mindset of doing a demo. Now once they signed us and we they cut the checks and everything, so now it's like okay, now we have to do an album. Anything from the demo never made it to the album. The very first song we did was Jingle Jangle. Oh, that's dope. That was the first. So out the gate, you already had like out this. the gate. Like we did that beat, and a lot of people didn't get it. Like I, 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 I'm at I'm at my missus crib. Um, I had I was playing some records. I was like pulling pulling pieces of records together, and I was like, Showbiz taught me how to do the work the SP twelve hundred. Well, you have it's not it's not similar, but you have like a similar yeah. kind of sound, yeah. energy. It's yeah. not necessarily like the sound. It's like the same kind of like it's just big. It's very Bronx. It's yeah. Big buildings. It's <laughs> yeah. like you know yeah. I'm a fucking push. <laughs> yeah. I'm a push you down. And yeah. Shit, you know. Matter of fact, I remember this. Showbiz wasn't feeling good. He was in the house. He lived right up the street from me as well. He's right up the street. I'm right. a, I lived on Story Avenue. He's up the street on Story Island. So Showbiz had a room in the back, and he had his equipment back there. So I was like, well, show. And we had just got signed. I was like, yo, man, I want to work on some beats. So I said, but you got, I, I want you to teach me how to use the machine. So he's teaching me from the back. Like, he showed me, and as I'm messing with it, he went back to lay down because I think he was coming down with the flu. So he would yell from the back <laughs> room. He'd be like, um, put it in sequence such and such like and he and I would run back go, what you said <laughs> but he he taught me showbiz taught me how to work the SP 1200 in the 950 wow in his crib and once he 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 taught I was working on on jingle jangle in his crib and he was helping me you know do the drum program or whatever he was showing me how to do it and then I took the floppy disk to Calliope and then that's when I added everything else to it. Wow. Okay. But the meat and potatoes, like the very start of it, the burnt, burnt, all that started at Show's Crib. Wow. Yeah. So he was, and yeah, so he was kind of had, it's not, he produced one song on the album, he I think, right? He did. Who's it on? Who's it on? Showbiz right. did that. But basically you did the, the bulk of it. I did the rest of, I did, I did the whole album except Who's It On and um, Mr. Long did Once Upon a Time. Oh yeah, Once Upon a Time, right. And I, did he do one other song? And Zooty Bang. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. He did two. He think Long did two, and right. I did the rest, yeah. So that was my beginning. That was, I always, the thing was, is like a DJ, like, you could expect Pete Rock to be a producer of Large Professor, Showbiz, or Diamond, because these guys have records, and they're DJs. So you have a sound, you have an ear, you have an ear for music, so you know how to mess with it. And I was... Being that I was a DJ, I had an ear for music, so I collect records. Like, and that was another thing too. I was on tour with Dres. We went everywhere, so I would, me and Long would stop. So you hit all the spots. Yeah, we be in Detroit, Chicago, wherever we was at. We get off the bus. You know, Dres was fly. Dres was on his fly guy shit. Dres would be like, he go shopping. Right. Dres go get him. His, <laughs> you know, Dres was always fresh. To this day, Dres is yeah. just fresh. He really like personified that. Yeah, you know? he has a look. And that's his look, and he stayed with it. Dress always yeah, fresh. The ill V-neck sweaters, the, yeah, the, the leather sweaters, jacket. Yeah, yes. that's, that's dress. Yeah. So <laughs> dress would go shop. Me and Long would go to the record stores, right? And we would come back and have boxes of records under the bus. So that's what we did. So I was always into just you know buying records. So I just didn't have the equipment. So I was like, when I sign, and that's what I did. You know, I was like, I'm gonna go buy me some equipment, and I just didn't know how to work it. So Sean right. taught me how to work it. And then I would go in the studio and just lay everything out. Uh, it's thorough, bring it, whatever, whatever. Right, right. Whatever I was feeling at the time, yeah. pull out the record, sample it, chop it, whatever I felt yeah, like. Yeah, classic multi layer samples, mm -hmm. classic hip hop shit. Um, and then after the record, you know, came out, 
like what was just briefly to what was that experience you know for you guys because yeah. you had you had a couple of videos you had the M- mtv was still like you, you know yo yo mtv raps was still very active rap city yeah. so you have that exposure that's how yeah. i was exposed yeah. to you yeah. Yeah. you know i'm 10 years younger than you so yeah. my and i grew up in virginia in southwest virginia so it wasn't near a city so mm-hmm. Closest city is Roanoke, and I didn't go to Roanoke very often. You know, yeah, it was a college I know, town. I know Roanoke. Yeah, right, right. I know Roanoke. <laughs> so anyway, but so we had videos like the rest of the country. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? So uh, there wasn't really a record store and college radio, which yeah, where I got into the radio was big back then. Right. Yeah. yeah. So what was that? How what was that experience from the mid '90s for you guys? Because there was just that one album. And that's it. Yeah. You know? it, we they would we would travel with with Drez. And then we would do like radio runs, like you said. We do a co- couple of college radio shows, and the record is weird. It's like everybody at first, the label liked it, but then we would play it for certain people, and they would be like, "Yo, um, it ain't got a baseline, or they don't have what? this." And I was like, "Man, so fuck people that baseline. This shit is hot." Right. But then everybody, everybody liked it. I would bump into people in parties. I remember um, Eric Sermon ran into a friend of mine, um, Lenny Yes from Rock Rock Nation, and he Lenny had on a Legion T-shirt. Dope. Oh. And he asked Lenny, he said, "Yo, you know them dudes?" <laughs> and Lenny was like, "Yeah, you know the big dude Q. That's my man." And he was like, "You could get in contact with him." And then he gave um, Lenny gave Eric Sermon my number, or he called me right on the spot, called my house. I thought somebody was playing. He was like, yo, it's it Eric Sermon. I'm like, right. Eric And I mind you, I'm an EPMD fan. I grew up. Right. I grew Absolutely. up. Absolutely. Like music wise, Marley Mall and EPMD is what I was bumping in my truck. You can hear that too in that production too, because it's yeah. that big sound. It's that kind of aggressive but funk yeah. oriented sound. Right? Yeah, I bumped them. Yo, know, Marley Mall was the man to me. Eric, I didn't even know Eric was doing all the music, but EPMD they was the dudes to me. So when he called and was like, "Yo, I'm putting together," I think he was doing Death Squad or something like that. And then um, he was like, "Yeah." Yada yada. I ended up going to meet him. Met him at a club. Like the re- the reception that was good because people, for whatever reason, they kind of gravitated to my verse on that song. So it was people. You know, I ran into Method Man. Method was like, "Yo, I like you know, I like what you what you're doing." Or or he gave me props on the beat. Right. Because they was like, "Yo, who did the beat?" And as time was going on, people was like, who did the beat? Who did the beat? The Jingle like, Jangle. Yeah, Jingle right. Jangle. And I was like, yeah, I did it. And we just rocked out. We was doing shows here and there. But the the label was going through a transition where it was weird. It appeared like Mercury, now I could be wrong, but this is what it looked like to me. They, when we got there, Mercury was predominantly like a, a country white oriented label they had kiss i think they had golf was it golf brooks or one of them country dudes right i, I, was, I don't remember if yeah, golf brooks was signed not, Mercury, golf, not but, golf brooks oh uh, what's miley cyrus father what's his name oh uh billy ray cyrus he was signed to mercury so those were your label mates yeah right. so these guys you would see their plaques all over the place right so at the time jingle jangle is bubbling and we're like we're going into '94. They were changing. Now, mind you, our label mates and with it was Blase, Blase, Black Sheep, The Legion, Diamond D, Ed O G. Um, Cause were you on Chrysalis too? Was it a split nah, thing? You're just nah, um, no, we were Mercury. Just, we were just Mercury. So I noticed the shift. Like they were getting rid of all of the, the Vanessa Williams was having issues. Brian McKnight. Um, Tony, Tony, Tony. Gotcha. All right. Joe. Right. And at the time, we ended up doing a tour at Tom Tom Club, right? Really? Yeah. And I was kind of, I don't want to say I was on my pro black thing, but I was reading a lot. Right. And because I went through my phase in high school hanging out with the five percenters, but then when I got back touring, and this is probably like one of the last tours. The first tour, you just party, 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 hang out, having a good time. Right. Oh, we out here with Scarface. Oh, we are running with Cypress Hills. Like it was, 
the nineties was one big giant party. Right. But when we did the Tom Tom Club, I was just doing a lot of self education, finding myself as a young man. So I'm doing all this reading. So I want to take maybe the me doing the reading at the time. It had my mindset like in a pro black moment, and the Malcolm X movie came out. So I would go up to the label, and I'm like. You know, when you in that militant mindset, it's like they're getting rid of the black people. So that's how I was thinking. So it was unfolding in front of me. Right. I was like, why you're getting rid of Vanessa Williams was huge. Brian McKnight was huge. Everybody's yeah. all huge these people pop stars. huge. Yeah, yeah. But you're keeping all of the the white artists. Exactly. Right. And, and I that's that classic regime change of the label too. So and they're that's like, exactly what happened. Right. And around the time that they were doing it, Ed Eckstein, he's half black. Okay. His father's a jazz musician, Billy Eckstein. Ed was giving me this story. He called one, his secretary, assistant, whoever she was, she called my house. And she was like, um, Q's, this is blah, 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 whatever her name. Um, Ed would like to see you. I'm like, see me? Right. You know, so. He had called for you before, a, right? Never. I, I, I met Ed, but never. He's the president. He's running. He's like Russell Simmons at the time. Right. You know what I'm it's saying? unusual to get a call yeah, so from I'm the like, president. Why are you calling me? So I go to meet him, and he's like, he's like, yeah, he had a big corner office. He's like, Q, sit down. Let me talk to you for a minute. And he's like, let me tell you a quick little story. He's like, I'm going in my building. He lives somewhere in Midtown. He said, these kids hanging out in the front of the building. So they're having this conversation about rap. And he said, you know, your group came up in the conversation. And they was like, um, he says, so he says, so how do y'all? I asked him, how do y'all feel about the Legion? They was like, yo, we like them, we think they dope, but the big dude, he's he's the one. That's oh, that's the one I like. So he said, that's what that's why I'm bringing you here now, because of that particular conversation. He said, and that's not the only one. He said, I had several conversations and they went the same way. So he's asking people about you and stuff like yeah. that. Right? So he is like, I would like to sign you to a solo. He said, now I'm not saying get rid of your guys, but he said, what do you think of doing, at the time it was cassettes. He said, we do half of the Legion and the flip side would be all you, you solo. Hmm. And I'm like, okay, bet. And what's so crazy, like that's what it was in the very beginning. It was molecules in the Legion. I have a cassette in my really? house that says that. No way. And I'm like, I, I thought it sounded like a superhero name. I was <laughs> it like, does, Let's yeah. just call it the Legion. I was like, Molecules in the Legion just sounds crazy. But then it was going back to that because he wanted me to do a solo. So it was yeah. back to... Getting pulled mo back into that. Molecules right. in the Legion. So I'm like, I bet. So I went back. I told the guys. They was like, hey, man, whatever it takes to keep us going, let's right. do it. And he was about to... He wanted me to record something. So I went, I did a song. I, I don't even know where the song went, what happened to it, but it came out hot. I gave it to him. He loved it. And that's when we was about to do the negotiations where he was going to shoot me the contracts, whatever the case may be. And that's when all the, everybody was, that wow. was black, was pushed out. Wow. And they even got rid of him. Whoa, really? And Damn. as it's happening, I'm, it was a, it was a, a young lady, I, I, if I'm correct, her name was Julie. I don't know if I get it. She, she was white white chick she was pretty and she had long hair but she was so like you would have a conversation with her about anything she was smart and she was into world like she knew like about blacks and uh, um, uh, putting blacks in a box and, and, and people being categorized like she we and her would have these Weird, un, weird, unorthodox conversations, mm -hmm. and I was like, "She's deep, and she knew the struggle." And, and out of everybody up there, she was the one that I was. I would say to her, "Like, yo, you see what's going on here?" And she was like, "You're not off. Like, it's happening." Okay. In so many words, she said, "Everything that you're thinking is happening." And next thing you know, everybody was gone, but everybody that was gone. They never resurfaced. I don't know where Diamond D went. I don't know where Ed O.G. went. Right. Uh, Drez and them never recorded anything. Right, before. right. Uh, Joe was the only one I know. Joe left and went to Job Records. Right, right. And I right. think when that was happening, 
or as it was happening, I think Ja jumped on him like we gonna take you. Right. So they snagged him up. But yeah, other but than that, a lot of people. Blase, blase. That OG. Uh, yeah, Vanessa Williams. Everybody just it just was gone. But wow. all the other white artists stayed there and they were wow. functioning label. But right. after that, they ended up falling. And sure, Mercury's gone. Mercury now is under the Universal umbrella. Right. Right. But at the time. If I if I if I saw it or I was paying attention to it sooner, I would have been like, you know what? Let me go talk to somebody over at Atlantic or Def Jam or whatever. Yeah, to make that jump, try to yeah, you know exactly. not fall into the water, so exactly. to speak, or whatever. Right. And at first, I thought it was just <clears throat> us. I was taking it personal, but then, like I said, I'm doing all my, I'm looking, I'm watching. It was everybody. It wasn't mm. just us. Damn. And that's a great point, though, because those, uh, especially the hip hop artists, didn't, wouldn't have another, um, you know, quote unquote major label album following that. So they all went, exactly. they eventually went the independent route mm -hmm. one way or another mm -hmm. to varying degrees of success, too. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a trip. What was the connection with Dennis Scott? Was he your was he your oh, manager? Yeah, yeah, he was our manager. I forgot. I Dennis, Dennis Scott of the Orlando Magic yeah, at the yeah, time, yeah, yeah. who rhymed on the album. Yeah, before. yeah, he's on the album. Uh, shout out to my man D Scott. Um, yeah, he he took uh, yeah. Uh, like I said back then, a lot of people we would bump into. They took a liking to the song, and um, I remember running into Shock him. Cause we were, oh, we, we, uh, we were flavor unit. flavor unit. We were Dresden and was managed by Shaquem. So I was around him and Latifah and Naughty all the time. So when our record dropped, Shaquem was like, "Yo, Q's, I'm feeling that joint." And um, that was that was another thing that our problem in our career. We didn't have proper management. Mm. Cause I think if we had management, we could have went way further than what we did. Sure. It yeah. was like it was almost like we were managing ourselves. So, which is interesting because at that time, you know, to be signed and stuff, there probably weren't a lot of groups that were. I, now I don't know for sure, but you know, there weren't a lot of groups like that. You know, that you were kind of just uh, sort of fell into this sort of position after you know, n you know, uh, being kind of artists, in, you know, in your own right. But it's not like you had a manager that created a deal for you and created a group. It's just like an organic thing. It was like your friends and basically it was like, fuck it, you know, let's start doing yeah. joints. We have an opportunity. Let's, you know, yeah. is that inaccurate? I don't want yeah, to see accurate. You're uh, very accurate because there was no, I remember, okay, me and Smash all the time, DJing, rapping. I remember it was like a little studio in the building over there by, it was a guy, his name was Rich over there by CeeLo's mother's house. We used to go to Rich's house and do little little pre-production demos. He had a small little setup in his room and I would do a beat and smash with rhyme on it. Then I would do a beat and it'd be smashing and G-Rod. Then I had another song where I did a beat is smash, G-Rod, Pat. Like I said, the guys that I came up with and all stuff production I've done. So, I think the only time ever, me, I, I had, I forgot how, oh, Chris, Light, it was Chris Lighty, I'm trying to figure out how that even happened. I told Chris, I was like, yo, you know, worked on a little demo, Chris tried to, he sent me somewhere, and then he sent, I don't know how or why, he sent me to Ralph McDaniels. And we Uncle sat, Ralph. We, yeah, we went and sat with him, but nothing came of it, nothing right. happened, and then the streets kind of caught my attention. So I left it alone. It was like, you know, and I don't, not to, I didn't, not to say I didn't have the time, but in my mind was like, man, I don't really have time to be running around no labels trying to see they, who they, who's going to give me a deal. Right. So then as life was going on, everything just happened. You know what I'm saying? Chi, you know, Chi's brother, like I said, we growing up together. He did what he did, had to go to jail. Chi, linking with Drez, and then she introducing me to Drez, and then Drez and him was like, oh yeah, we about to drop an album. I'm running with him. Drez was like, oh shit, you rap. And it all unfolded like that. And it right. wasn't no me and Smash running around shopping demos and right, right. all that. And we didn't have no manager to help us out. So back to the question with Dennis, 
hindsight when Shaquem came to me, because Dresden was with Shaquem, I should have went and sat with Shaquem because nothing really, uh, no other manager, Shaquem and them was good. And I think if I would have went with them, he would have made certain things happen with the Legion. Uh-huh. But it was a transition going on at Flavor Unit. And Lynn Scott, she handled the day-to-day black sheep things over at Flavor Unit. Whenever questions we have, of course, we chop it with Latifah. We see her mom and shock him at the time. Apache was there. Everybody right. was there. We chop it up with everybody. It was like a family unit because we even went on tour with, um, we did a Black Sheep, Naughty, Queen Latifah tour. Dope. It was like a Flavor Unit tour. So it was one big family type of atmosphere. But at some point, certain people was going certain directions. So when Lynn Scott was leaving, she was move. She was leaving to go with Dennis. No, no relation, but they just have the same last name. And Dennis Scott started a company called Three D Entertainment, and he wanted to. Um, he wanted us to sign us to his management. You know, um, Lynn told Dennis about us. Like I guess Dennis saw the video and was like, "Yo, Lynn was like, oh, that's my boys, Q's, that's my people's. He runs with Dreads, da da." So Dennis flew us out. Dennis was a good dude. He flew us out to Miami, um, Orlando a few times and rolled out the red carpet. We stayed at his crib in limo. We're going to Universal Studios. Right. We're going to All-Star Weekends. Dennis held us down in that way. And then we got, you know, Shaq. It was Dennis, Shaq, and, and, and Penny. They were right. a three-man team, so we got cool with everybody. Shaq yeah. was Shaq was in the studio with us when we recorded that song with Dennis. Oh, so dope. Shaq was around a lot, and we were, you know, we used to go to Shaq birthday parties. Shaq was definitely very in in tune to the hip hop yeah. community of that time yeah, too. Yeah. Obviously, working with a gang yeah. of different artists. Yeah, he was um he was moving off that um Fushnik and song. Right, right. Yeah, yeah so, he blew up off that one. Yeah, for so, a hot one. Yeah, Shaq was definitely around. It's just that Dennis, the basketball players. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So they don't know anything about management right i think if if dennis was tr- to try to do it now he probably might mindset for it because he's not playing and well, he was like in the game and he was like pretty much at the top of his yeah. game at that time so three, three pointer it yeah. was his he was killing it yeah so yeah dennis he tried but nothing nothing came of it like he right. didn't really and then when the situation came and i'm not saying anything bad about him but Bone Thug, we were we were um all under the same booking agency, um, Peter Schwartz. Yeah, and he still he still he's does still it. Still rocking, yep. yeah, Peter yeah. Schwartz. He's still he's still doing it. That's so, amazing because he does like you know he does the big you know trap cats now too. Oh, wow, he, I didn't even know that. Yeah, he's still a big player, big player. Yeah, he yeah. did um he had us with Dreads at um BB Kings. That's what's up. Yeah, so Peter's still doing it. So. Peter Schwartz, he had us, OC, MOP, he had all of, all of what ninety artists at the t- 90s artists at the time. So Bone Thug was pop. They was just blowing up, and they were going on tour, and they wanted an East Coast artist. And this is and exactly how the conversation went. Peter said, like he called us down to the office, and he said, they're going on tour. They have to pick between MOP, OC, and the Legion. And they wow. was like, yo, we want the, the them guys where the dude jumped in the pool. Ha! We want them. From the Jingle Jangle video, exactly. right? Exactly. So I was like, bet. So he had me hype. I was like, oh, bet. So we went to the label, and the label didn't want to support the tour. Like, they didn't want to really? send us out. And, and, like, thinking back, like, I'm mad. I wish, like, if I was still doing what I was doing, because when the music started, I... When I started running with dress, I just stopped. I was it was no I call it the pavement. It was no pavement action for me. Right. Everything stopped. I was like, it's music a hundred percent. Cause if I'd have been still in in the pavement with the music, then I'd have paid for everything myself. Right, right, right. You can fund things I Exactly. Think. Cause the bus was I think at the time three fifty a day. Yeah, bus is expensive. Yeah, it was you know, you pay for the fuel, you gotta pay for hotel, the driver yeah, and all that lot. shit. Yeah. So the money that they were paying us, it was short money. I bet. To be the opening uh, act? Yeah, yeah, opening act. I don't think it was more than, it was no more than $1,500 for 
It was no more than that. It was something short. Right. So we was doing the calculations. I was like, that might not cover everything. So we was like, went to the label. We might need, we're going to need tour support. And the label was like, y'all don't sell records in that market that y'all go on the tour. Like the way this tour is going, y'all don't sell right. records. So I was, my argument with, not argument, but my, you know, defense to Lynn, I said, Lynn, tell them that we will sell records in that market once we hit the stage and people see us. They're going to be like, oh, who's those dudes? Because I said, once they see us perform. Yeah, you got to break the market exactly, a little bit. They didn't get it. So they gave us the sheet, you know, the sound scan and show you all your sales. Right. We were selling records up and down the East Coast. And nowhere else. Maybe a, we selling a little bit in Cali, like Oakland, right. certain areas. Sure. But it was all East Coast from up and from Boston down to Florida, everywhere in the East Coast. So it was like we it was a Midwest tour or something like that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, so, and technically, Bone Thugs, you know, Cleveland's a Midwest. Exactly. Technically, right? they didn't want to send us. Right. So then we went to Dennis. Well, I didn't go to him, but I had Lynn. I said, Lynn, talk to Dennis, man. It's just, I wish I would have did it myself, but. Right. She's speaking for us. She's, the, you know, running a management company. So she went to him, and he didn't want to um, put up the money to, to send us out. So we were just stuck. I was like, right, how we can't do it? And we didn't have the money. We were artists living off of the label, like right. whatever they, whatever check they gave us, whatever money we made, that's what we made. It wasn't like we had a whole game of other money. Right, right. So. And that can be a that can be a very potentially problematic scenario to get in when you're only relying on a label, mm -hmm. and then the label, you know, they're not the greatest people to rely on. Yeah, exactly. You know, because exactly. they kind of don't give a fuck about you. They don't. You know? And I was pissed, and I was like, man, damn, like it was mad. If we had the right management, and even now they got sponsors of everybody. You, you, sure. don't, you don't see a skateboard without a sponsor involved. Right. So it wasn't like that back then. Mm -hmm. So if we even had sponsor, some sponsorship or the manager to get a sponsor, we would have went. And right. there's no telling where the Legion would have went if we would have went on that tour. And right, because it's building for, blocks, yeah, too. Yeah, it is. And especially for those guys to even... I mean, I know every people see MTV, but I was like, I didn't even think we were on a radar for them to say, right. yeah, I want them dudes. So... I mean, it's a trip to think, to look now and be like, to have Bone and the Legion yeah. on some, you know. Yeah. It's cool. I mean, it's, it's yeah, that's kind of what it was back then. It was, you could intermingle so many different regional styles and it'd be totally cool. But it's, that era is exclusive to that time, I feel like, to a certain degree, you know. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I've always been curious about it because it was such an interesting addition to to your got to this, you know, very unique kind of career arc with the mm -hmm. Legion, having Dennis Scott, he's like yeah. a high profile yeah. ball player, you know, and, yeah. and 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 all that. We had good times with Dennis. Like I'm I sure said, it was a hangout thing though. Like we hung out, we had fun. Right. But it was no money made. Right. And you're what is probably his only first and only act. Yeah, or something, we were right? the only ones. I remember but he one. just loved you. He just was like, I like those guys. Yeah, I yeah. like to hang out with those cats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dennis yeah, he liked us, man. I remember one night Maria Davis used to do this spot on 86th Street. I forgot the name of it. There was so many hangout spots back then. I remember I ran into Dr. Dre in there. Wow. Everybody used to be in there. Um, but anyway, Jay-Z was in there, and I think at one point they were talking, Dennis and, and Jay was talking. Like, Jay might have, like, I think at the time Dennis was thinking about bringing Jay over to... Um, 3D entertainment, but at the time Jay wasn't signed anywhere. Right, it was just conversation. Right, right. And around that time, that's when I heard. I, I think they get, Jay gave them a demo or something or some songs he worked on, and he had a song on there, man. It was called '95 South. I think stuck in my head to this day. Really, I don't think. Yeah, I'm not. I don't <laughs> think that one ever really made it out there. Put it out. That song was so hot, and it was a street. It, you know, if he wasn't a street guy. You want back to pick then, up on yeah, what it's about, right? A lot, a lot of stuff Jay did back then was street stuff. So 95 South was about, 
you know, you hustling, you going down 95, sure. stuff, going to towns or whatever. Right, like, right. Yeah. Roanoke. Yeah, shit yeah, like yeah. That. <laughs> yeah so. Spots in the Carolinas and <laughs> yeah, shit like that. So yeah. that song was dope. Right. I think somewhere they said something about sending a chick to Western Union or something, something. Right, right, right. Song was dope. And that, and that, and I remember having that conversation with Clark Kent, because Clark was the he was the main one talking about Jay, like he was the main one, and he was tight with Lynn too, because we used to go out, and I remember having that conversation. Yeah, Clark Kent was such a still such an influential yes, DJ yes, too, yes, yes, and yes. incredible producer as well. Yeah. Clark is dope, and he's a good dude, man. Clark is a good guy. I always enjoy seeing him. So, there's two. Acts that people probably wouldn't necessarily associate you with that I want to talk to about talk to you about before we kind of wrap stuff up. And I don't even really know if I totally understand the scope of like. Uh, and you tell me, just keep it real with me too, because I might be wrong. I don't, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but I know uh, one, especially because I think we were talking about this back in the Knitting Factory days. Was you you worked or did something with Justin Timberlake, right? Oh, okay. Now with the Justin thing. I didn't do anything for him. He had a... Okay, I'm going to go back a little bit. It was this guy, Billy Mann, which he's a good friend of mine, and he's a big producer on the pop side. Actually, I haven't talked to him for a minute, but I just got... I talked to him two days ago. Oh, wow. And um, good guy. Good good guy, good heart. Love this guy. And um, I met Billy, oh, man, in the 90s, in the late 90s, so, he got a a copy of my, uh, of one of my men's black. I think black gave Billy a CD of mine. They were in the gym together. Gave Billy a CD of beats I did, and Billy took the CD home and came back and was like, "Yo, who did those beats?" And he's like, "Yo, my man Q's." So Billy wanted to meet. We met, and he was like, "Yo, I love this stuff you're doing." But he's pop. Billy plays mad instruments. He's Bass, guitar, keyboards. He's he's an instrument guy. He writes. He sings. He engineers. He does everything. And if you was to Google him, you'll see a whole bunch of stuff he does. Right. So he's in the pop world. Celine Dion, Ricky Martin. Like he's worked with everybody. So he's like we, we become friends. We're hanging out. He had an office on Fifty Something Street on the East Side near Park Avenue, bro. It, he's just he's a good guy he's doing a lot and he's like yo I want to work with you so he brings me he f we fly up to Canada to work with this girl her name is Amanda Marshall hmm. and me and him and Peter Asher he's a Grammy award winning producer he's right. a big guy so the three of us we up there and we record her whole album I think we were up there for like a week wow so okay. we, we did all the production and Billy wrote all the songs. She wrote some. She wrote some of the songs as well. What are you doing? Drum programming doing, or I'm sequencing? Doing, yeah, I'm doing the beats, like the actual drum programming. So what we would do, say I would, I, I'm all, every everything. I'm always chopping s drum sounds from a vinyl. So say in one song, I would take one piece of President, and I would chop the kick, the snare, the hat, and I would play it back in a different pattern at 808 and as I'm doing it Billy would grab the guitar and he would just start vibing to whatever beat I'm doing Right. and then Peter would add and then Billy would get on the keyboards next thing you know it's a whole song but I did that on every song on her album wow so you really, it starts with you chopping up breaks yes and them kind of vibing off of that and what do you replace the breaks with like live drumming no, or something we they sample on, them? no they were so scared of samples, but they let me, they left, the, the way I did the drums, they left them. One or two songs, because we were in this, some big studio downtown, I think it was Sony Studio, and they had like a full-blown orchestra in there playing on top of my beat. Wow, that's dope. And I was like, wow. So it led from that. The album went platinum, you know, I started getting checks from that. That's amazing. And then, um, yeah, uh, she's traveling, then I think, she did put out greatest hits like yeah so the checks I'm getting plaques from what because she's big in Canada and then um, after that it was other records Billy would pull me on Diane King mm. um, he pulled me on a couple of projects he would be working on he'd be like yo this is what I'm feeling I'll take a break chop it up and then 
he was looking, he was starting a management company and he found this girl, her name is Esme Dentis. She's from the Netherlands, from Amsterdam. So he flies her over. She's a huge YouTube sensation. She's popping on, on the internet at the time. And he he's managing her. So then he says, oh, he wants to get her a deal. So he knows everybody. So he takes her, I think, to go to Jermaine Dupri. Uh, he took her to Sony. He took her to a couple places. So he took her to meet Justin, and they hit it off. And she, you know, Justin Timberlake, so she went crazy. She's like, oh, my God. Da, da, da. Right. So Justin started a record label at the time, so she was like, yeah, I want to go with Justin. So she signs, and next thing you know, boom, Justin, the, the Future Love Sex album drops. Tours getting ready to start. Billy's like, yo, I want you to go out on the road with her. Um, DJ look over her, whatever the case may be. So I actually get on stage and perform with her. So I'm at every Justin Timberlake show as the show starting on the first person you see. Really? And <laughs> lights and the people. Molecules from the Legion exactly. is the first person first you see. First person you see. And all I'm, the arenas all over the place. Right? Yes, exactly. Wow. And I'm like, are y'all ready for Justin Timberlake? Are y'all ready for S.M.A. Dentist? I'm doing all that. Right. Put the beat on. She comes out. She's singing. She's dancing. And then Justin comes out after, but I'm the opening that. Right. And that's everywhere. We went everywhere. What are you going off of? Turn. You're not going off of turntables, are you? We we had uh, Ableton the, or something. The CD, the Pioneer. Yeah, CDJ. CD, yeah, we right. had that. So that's what I'm DJing with. Because this is what, like 2006 or something. This, like yeah, that. exactly. Yeah, so. you dead on. Yep, 2006, and we went, we went around with him maybe twice. We went on that road, we went on tour twice with him. Was he cool? Cool as shit, man. Mm -hmm. they are cool dude, man. Like, oh man, we went everywhere. One place we went, he had rented out the, we was in London, I think. With the O2 Arena is in London. Right. right? We was at the O2 Arena. He sold that out for like two weeks. Wow. I think, I think he did it for like two weeks straight. So we stayed out there. He had got the movie theater for us to go. I think Bruce Willis, Live, Live Hard, Die Hard, something like that uh -huh. came out. Like, got yo, no tour bus. We flew everywhere. Wow. <laughs> yo, yo, that got in, man. And then, you know, and I'm with him every day. Like, you know, we get up and, you know, you know how you have the tours and they have food. Right. This is elaborate. Like, I would think so. Breakfast. You, it's lunch. not just a continental breakfast no, at the hotel, right? There's none of that. Breakfast. And I remember Billy came out on a couple of shows. So Billy, I remember, I met him. But then Billy came on the road and was like, yo, you know, it's my man Cubes. You know, he worked with Most Def. Like, he kind of tried to give him, like, a quick little resume of who I was. And Justin was like, yeah, now I met him. He's a cool dude. So, yeah. And um, I would see him at breakfast. They didn't feed us at lunch. But dinner time, I I've been on so many tours with Dreads. Never a layout like that. It's like he had gourmet chefs in the back right. cooking for us every night. Mm. I used to be like, this is crazy. And I'm like, it was it was a great experience. My passport, I'm on my second book messing wow. with him. And then we came home for some time and then we went back out again and everywhere. Belgium, Ireland, Finland. We went everywhere. Only place we, mm. didn't, we didn't go was Africa. Wow. We was everywhere. And then after that tour, Billy sent this out with Enrique Iglesias and it was the same thing. And I think I met everybody pretty much in the industry. Enrique Iglesias was one of the coolest guys really? I hung out with. And it's the same scenario where you're opening, you're same the opening scenario, act. Same scenario. First thing you see at Enrique <laughs> tour. And that guy's bigger than I thought. Private jet and all that. At the time right. when rappers was getting rid of their jets, he was on his, he had right. two. Wow. Like, that guy is huge. You, were you traveling with him, or you had to travel on your own? No, we, what, the same thing, same setup, no tour bus. When he fly, we fly. Only thing, he had a private jet. We'd he had his on, own. Yeah, he'd get on his jet, and we'd fly in coach. Oh, okay, gotcha. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. But it wasn't like, yo, y'all get on y'all bus and meet me at the next stop. Right, right. We, everywhere he flew, we flew. I mean, to fly from show to show, that's, that's pretty dope. nice. That's yeah. dope. And it was, it was good. Same type of setup, Good ass food, and I think he had 
Uh, Grey Goose sponsored the tour, so that helps. There's Grey Goose everywhere. Are there any hip hop heads around? None. But this is this is a funny story, man. While we were on the Justin Timberlake tour, I ran into Craig G in Copenhagen. <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> and I and uh, I tell that I tell that like and to this day, Craig G be like, y'all ran into Q's in Copenhagen. So he's at Craig G. We I, I think at, oh he had Timberland. All right, we do the show. The show is huge. It's huge. And then everywhere we were at would be an after party. Of course. And Timberland was, would host the after party. So, so Timberland was on the road with you guys yeah, as Timberland well. Timberland was on the road too. So that's the thing. On Justin's tour, every stop it would be a celebrity would come. Like right. one, like two, a couple of the shows, Fergie came out and performed. Right. Um, ran into Will I Am. One of the shows, Madonna was there. You know, wow. Justin, anybody was going to pop up. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. That guy's huge. And um, a lot of the shows was big, big theaters. I mean, not theaters, on um, arenas, and right. they sold out. So it was always a huge thing. So after party in Copenhagen, and um, Timberland is DJing the after party, or hosting, or whatever the case may be. So I'm getting ready to walk in the spot, and I see the guy, and they're not letting him in. And I'm like, yo, that looks like Craig G. I said, that can't be Craig G. I was like, what would Craig G be doing all week? Right, you know, so I'm looking again. I'm like, I say, Craig, and he turned around. I was like, he's like, yo, you know what, I'm saying? I said, yo, what the hell are you doing out here, man? And he was like, yeah, man, you know, trying to get out. They won't, they, they won't, they wasn't, they're not letting me in or something like that. He said, I said, yo, and they knew that I'm with Justin, so I was like, yo, he's with me. So we walked in, and Craig was like, the hell are you doing out here? So I'm with them. <laughs> <laughs> That's so dope, man. Yeah, so. And yeah. just such another world, like yeah. from from the typical hip hop touring, and just like that's, that's a trip. Yeah, and I and I take the blame because every people ask you why Legion, why y'all took that long break? Because I met Billy in '98. Our album dropped in '94, so once I got when like I went I went from like I was not liking the game. I was like, yo, this game is whack, and right. like, it was just a transition, and I just didn't adapt to it. So then. When he pulled me over to the pop world, and I, saw, I was like, "All right, this is where it's at. It's rocking." I was like, "You know what? I'm gonna do this." So I ran with him from '98, and then you know everything was going good. And then I think like 2003, I packed up. I went and built a house out in Pennsylvania, the Poconos, and I just was traveling doing pop stuff with him. And then while I was over there, and I ran into Craig G, he introduced me to a promoter that had him out there. And that's when Craig was like, yo, y'all need to get out here. He was like, it's hip-hop venues that's popping out here. And then somewhere on the tour, um, 50 Cent came out, and he did um, AO Electronics. Right, like that, that was their, uh, yeah. yeah, their collab. Right? Yeah, so he came out, and they did that song together. And that's when I noticed, I was like, Europe is big for underground rap, and I didn't know it. And as soon as I got back, I was like, fellas, we gotta get back in the mix, man. We gotta get back in the mix. It's popping in Europe. And I didn't really go to no underground parties, but I remember, like, it's places we would go, and I would get my tourists on. I'd go buy records and then walk around. Right. And I remember seeing a Ghostface um, poster that he was somewhere out there. And I was like, yo, man, these dudes coming out here. And now everybody wants to be in Europe. Right, yeah. So... When um after the Enrique Iglesias tour, uh, I was back and and settled and then the Esme thing kind of fizzled out. Um, Justin, he I think he was just too busy to really entertain the record label. Sure, you know what I'm saying? Because he had us back and forth. We flying to Cali. I was in California a lot with Esme. I was flying back and forth to the Netherlands, running around with her. But he had her and he had another artist, a friend of his. Then he opened a restaurant, Southern Comfort. Right. Then he had a clothing line, and he was doing Shrek. He would have to leave the tour and come right back. Like he was just doing a lot. Yeah. So he to put his energy into a record label. It just wasn't there. Yeah. It's that's it's a it's a time consuming job for sure. And I think and he and he did a song with Esme. They had a single together, but I don't really know what happened. Like I, I don't know. I don't think they released it in the states. I think they put it out in. In Europe, I don't think they ever released it here, and then his record label just fizzled out. Cause mm. 
Yeah, and then once that fizzled out, then, you know, I kind of lost contact with Esme. I mean, I could reach her. I had phone numbers on her and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, but, but the project kind of yeah, died out. Yeah, right? that's it. And then that was the end of that. And then Billy, um, he's very close with Pink, so he's on all her projects. So he pulled me in on Stupid Girls. I hung out with them in the studio that night. And then um, she wanted me to go in. I went in and I'm like doing ad libs in the background. If you listen to the song, you can hear me. Oh, shit. So I'm just running my mouth, you know, pink, you know, so do your thing and do your thing. Like just talking right. on the record. And then, Classic um, ad lib stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, um, yeah, so that went platinum or whatever. They sent me a plaque for that. You get checks for that if your now, voice is on now that. I didn't get it. I, they paid me outright. I didn't. Oh, I would have loved to get a publishing on that because that record was killing Z100 and all these pop stations. So then later on, her next album, Billy called me in for that one too, and I did some beats. I, I did straight like hip hop samples, and then the label was acting crazy with the sample. And, I mean, she did the song. She sang over it and everything. So there's a joint that you did, I did for, for Pink, but yeah. it never surface wow. the label was scared of the sample or whatever and I mean I got it off a sound lab a sound library right and I chopped it I was like I'm, I'm trying to convince Billy like yo let them know like just because they knew it was a sample yeah like yeah. they were like nah I mean Billy even bought me a guitar and all that like yo learn to play this thing wow he was like cute you talented learn to play this like kind of trying to stir me away from the samples but the samples is in my heart I'm yeah you're hip hop yeah I'm, I, I can't I can't do a record without putting some type of sample in it. Right. And I'm, and that's the thing with digging. The whole DRTC concept and guys like Premier and Large Professors and Pete Rocks, like they sampling things that people can't find. Like, you know, right. that's the whole art of digging. Grabbing a record nobody heard. Not I'm not taking away from Diddy and nobody like that, but you know, they sampling Diana Ross and right. you know, obvious records that everybody right. has that you could go buy, but with the whole you know, hip hop guys as collectors, you know, they sampling a record that might have been a hundred copies printed in the whole world. Or yeah, something definitely. Like that, you know. Yeah. And now, so what's the Gwen Stefani thing? Is there a similar situation? You because did you work? You work? No, 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 no. Because no. nah. there was a. Did I not see this plaque in the video? Oh, that that was a, a pink plaque. Oh, okay, gotcha. Pink. All yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, that was Pink's plaque. My mistake. Yeah, yeah, Pink. And um, yeah, she uh. And she's cool with people too, man. And, you know, I talked to Billy, like I said, like two days ago. So I'm going to end up trying to link back up with him. Oh, I hope so. Yeah, that it, would be amazing. It's been, it's, been a, it's been a gap. Now, in that gap, he was definitely helping me. It was artists that I was having issues with. Okay, like I had this guy and I work with to this day, my man, Money Ray. He's dope. We had a situation where... He was getting ready to get a deal at Universal, and Billy set that up. And at the time when they was about to sign him, again, the whole transition, they moved, uh, they got rid of Clive Davis over here, and then they fired Leo Cohen from here, and they moved him here, and then they fired L.A. Reid from here and brought L.A. Reid to Death Jam. Wow. And everybody was moving around. Um, Sylvia Rohn, all the big wigs was moved around, and the guy that was, I forgot who was running Universal at the time, he was about to sign Money Ray, and he got, he didn't get reassigned at another label. But like guys, like I said, like L.A. Reid was at, I think he was at, where the hell L.A.? Or oh, L.A. Reid had his own label, but right. then he ended up being the head guy at Def Jam. He did, yeah. And Leo Cohen, they got rid of him at Def Jam and yeah. sent him over to Atlantic, right. like Warner Brothers or something like that. So... This guy, he never resurfaced anywhere else. So the money rate deal didn't happen. So it got dead and you needed to figure out what to do with it or what? Yeah, I, I mean, I never, I still have the songs, never put them out. Had another artist, his name is P. Batters. He's from North Carolina. He spit, album was dope. It had production on it from Ski, Night Wonder. The project was dope. Gave it to Billy. Billy loved it. Billy jumped on the phone, called Sony. I went, had a meeting with the president. They were about to sign him. I got the contracts. Everything is a go. Billy's on tour. I give P. Batters the contract. And we about to do a contract and publishing deal with him. Like, yo, P, let's go. Yo, my lawyer said, da-da-da. I said, listen, man, no disrespect. 
to your lawyer, but don't listen to them small town little attorneys in your town. No disrespect to your town. <laughs> these big lawyers right. up here, there's no battle. There's no fighting. I said, Billy's lawyer is the same lawyer that represents Jennifer Lopez and Madonna. They're going to eat your lawyer up. Don't, right. don't fight this. This is a good thing. Let's just make it happen. Because once his lawyer, I don't know what he did. Did he do a Google search and find out who Billy was? Because you just say Billy Man. It's like, okay, I never heard of him. And you pull it up and you say, wait a minute, this guy worked with a lot of people and all these people were platinum. This guy got money. And that's what happened. They thought, yo, there's more money here. Let's get more money. I said, that's not going to happen. Right. I said, let me explain this to you. Labels are gone. They're not signing no artists unless you're part of, you're, you know, you're with Rock Nation or you're with Bad Boy or you're with So So Deaf. There's no... The, the era the era of people just getting signed without no affiliation to anybody it was like Common and The Roots and you know those days are over right, right? it's like right. you're getting signed with no affiliation nobody knows not to say nobody knew who the Legion was but nobody knows us you're getting signed directly with Sony and there's nobody no conglomerate over you so you need to get on this he yeah, it's a hell of an opportunity. Yeah, and he dropped the ball. They didn't sign it, and then by the time Billy came back and time passed, that law, his lawyer was gone, and then when he wanted to do it, Sony was no longer interested. Too much time had passed. But when they were interested and I told him let's do it, he didn't do it. Mm. And it was I had like two, three situations like that. So just probably just getting eaten up by the industry, you putting the work in, right? Completing the actual material, right? The project and his album would have, I think it would have been well received because he's a dope rapper. He's from North Carolina, but he sounds like he's from New York, except certain dialects, certain words right. that he say. But the music was, you know, Knife Wonder's from the South, but he's right. from, but his sound sounds like he's from New York. Right, right. So the album was dope, man. And I had like two, three situations where the deal didn't fall through and it wasn't my fault. Most recent, I had a situation, the most recent situation I had with with Billy, uh, I had this guy, he was young, he did a song, Billy heard it, loved it, and I, we went, had the meetings at the label, they was ready to sign him, and he did, he did the... Oh man, what's that Tamar and Vince show? He did the theme music to that show. Okay. And he wrote a song and, and produced a song for Tamar Braxton. So he signed a publishing deal. So that was a bit of a conflict there. And he had a manager, and the manager intervened and messed the whole deal up. And mm -hmm. she was like, yo, um, we, we got Timberland talking to us. I was like, he's talking. This is a done deal. Right. You want to go with something that's done or you want to go with somebody that's talking? And I'm not saying that Timberland can't make it shake, but he's talking to you. Right. This is a done deal. Even her husband told her, forget Timberland, go with Billy, because her husband was working at Sony at the time and was like, yo, Billy is a big deal. You know, he, he let's do it. She was dragging her feet, and next thing you know, that's another situation. The deal was off the Window table. Window closed, and that's it. Right? And then this guy, he ended up, ha something happened with his heart, and he ended up passing away. Mm. He was like young, like 24, oh, wow. 25 years old. And he kid was talented. He wrote, he sang, he did the beats, he was dope. And that was the last thing I had on the table with Billy. And it's like, everything I get on the table with him, it kind of fall, <laughs> falls apart, right. but it's never my fault. Right, well that's like kind of that gamble that you play when you're playing with the big boys and you're in that upper echelon of the industry where you put all this work in and you know the average underground hip hop head is completely oblivious to that you know because they only know you from the legion yeah. or from through black sheep and stuff exactly. like that while like you're completing whole albums of material that uh, are turned in done finished products that get somewhere in the midst of all that negotiation that's out of your hands because you're the producer, right? Mm -hmm. Essentially. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, then it's like, boom, done. And it sounds like a couple of times it was the actual vocalist or the artist 
like team that wasn't strong enough to be able to play ball with like yeah. the big boys and then it I falls had, apart. I had another girl. Her name is Tanya. She's still in my life, a good friend of mine. She's like my sister. Um, we had a deal. We had a, a situation for her. Billy set up publishing deal and she was on the fence and I mean Billy set up meetings I, we went and sat with Neo her and Neo was playing the piano together about to write a song together all through all through Billy's connections Billy wanted we had a, a, a publishing deal for her with BMG and um, she was like oh what's going on Billy's gonna steal my publishing he's gonna do this he's gonna oh, do that wow. and I was like nah what are you talking about I said you got shook oh. yeah I said this guy I said stop I said this guy got money what is he gonna get out of taking from you he's trying to help you and in turn he's trying to help me because Billy always felt that he wanted to see me with my own label my own situation like we would he would refer back to like a bad boy he's like I want you he said I see you having a puff daddy situation without stealing without the stealing of the publishing and we would mm. laugh he was like I don't see you taking nobody's publishing and we would laugh I said yeah if I had a bad boy situation I would love to blow up my artist and um, he helped me get that situation I'm going back and forth with BMG I had the contract sent to me and at the last minute you know she didn't want to sign it mm. wow man yeah so do you think that you would ever go back down that road again? Or where, where are you at with all that right now? What made me call him the other day was a friend of mine. Um, his name is Jermaine. My man, Maine. He, he found this girl. She sings. She writes. She's dope. She sounds good. She's attractive. She's, I think she's from Australia. She sings in Spanish. I, I think she's originally from El Salvador, but yo, she's dope. I li- he sent me like four or five songs on her. I listened. I was like, oh, all right. He's like, cues. Because Jermaine, he does like Jermaine and his brother Shelby. I grew up with both of them. They're from my block. They ended up moving out there to the Poconos where I'm at. Shelby does um, concerts and Jermaine does comedy concerts. All right. So the music, he's he came up with. He was in the studio when we was doing a Legion album. He grew right. up with me. So he's like, yo, cues. I need your help on this. So I said, all right. You know, let me hear it. Let me see what I could do. So once I listen, I call Billy. He's the one, the, the pop world, he's in that. You know what I'm saying? So I'm going to um, reach, I got to reach out to him again because he was in a meeting. So I didn't really get a chance to send him anything. But that's my next move. I'm going to see what we could do with her. Because mm. I saw what he did with Esme. Right. You know what I'm saying? And even though that was maybe short lived in a certain you know if you look at it in a certain perspective but it seemed very successful it, it for a was, while it was, it was popping it, right it was, it was successful for somebody that didn't have an album because we toured for like three years from two she never out, dropped an album she dropped a, remember, I, she dropped the album I, overseas with Justin right. I think in 2010 but from 2007 to 2010 we were touring mm-hmm. we was with him with the future love sex well right. or 2006 I think and then after his album fizzled out and he stopped touring, then we toured with Enrique yeah. Iglesias. Right. And we performing songs that she done. Like, when Billy found her, her album was pretty much done. But as we're touring, I gave her like a beat or two and she wrote to them. So as her first album's about to drop and she's writing for the second, I would have been on her second album. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? If everything would have went the way it went. Hmm. So while I was gone, and you know what the hell happened to the Legion, I was busy doing that. Right, right. <laughs> Which is, in, you know, yeah, it's just a, it's a, it's a crazy story. I mean, yeah. in a way, and it's, it's, um, it's definitely you've had a, you know, a hell of a life up to this point, man. I'm saying, <laughs> uh, it just, uh, yeah, and 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 now, you know, before we really wrap it up, uh, you know, obviously. This year, we'll probably see some new music from the Legion, too. So I'd like Definitely. to be able to talk about that a little bit. And, I mean, but first, the you have this solo record, your, sure fi- your yeah. debut yeah. solo yeah. thing after all these years. Yeah. Yeah. They finally got you to do a solo <laughs> thing with you and Showbiz, right? Yeah, yes. That's that's called... It's in a, a correct... I don't want everybody... Because everybody's thinking it's a full LP. It's an EP right now. And me and Show's got to go back in. And finish and make it a full LP. The EP is six songs. Six songs is perfect though. This day and age, yeah. man, that's yeah. an album now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like. yeah, six songs. And when we first, it, it, it came from 
Oh, years ago, when Ed X Stein wanted me to do the solo, and everybody kind of got wind of I'm going to be doing a solo, Showbiz wanted me to do a solo. He had a situation with Sony, and um, that's when I recorded Revenge. Mm, yes. And, and um, we ne he never released it. He released it on, on Japan. Right, there was a Digging in the Crates compilation, yeah, right? Exactly, yeah. he put it on there. So it's kind of resurfaced on the internet once there's social media and people were like, yo, whatever happened, yo, what happened with Q's and Showbiz or whatever. So I was like, yo, show, why don't we uh, shoot a video for that? The song is crazy old. We did that song like 98, I know, that's amazing. Yeah. I said, but well, let's shoot a video now. I said, the song still sounds relevant. Nobody... You know, it's gonna question what yeah, it was recorded. Yeah, it works. Yeah. So we shot the video now, off a song that was twenty years old. Where were you? Where was the vacation shit from? Oh, that that was in St. Thomas. Oh, that, nice, beautiful. Where, you know, like I said, my family's from there. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So we, I as a kid, I was sent out there every year. I mean, every summer as a kid until I was old enough to tell my father, like, Dad, I don't want to go this summer. I want to really hang with my friends in the city. Your relatives were there. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, my family and his. Car we went down for carnival. Um, That's what it was. Yeah, that scene on the street. Yeah, we went. To, yeah, we went for carnival, and um, I was like, yeah, let me get a shot of this. Like, let me put this in the video. You know. Oh, it was a perfect segue because like in the the lyrics follow right yeah, into exactly. That. Yeah, I said now now I'm gonna go on vacation. Who would have knew? Right. But, but that was the funny thing. I I'm telling that story about what happened. A little some of it true, some of it you know. So I'm telling the story, and as whatever at, at the time what happened back then, I really went on vacation after like I had a little confrontation, whatever, little, whatever the situation was. I ended up going on vacation, right. so I said it in the song. Right. And then I did, you know, for me to, you know, now to shoot the video, I said, yeah, I gotta put us on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know? um, and then the Legion is gonna probably have another project this yes, year as well. We, we recorded the album, man, and we're having a little. Little situation going on with the with the label. I don't know what's going on with politics, the man. I hate it, man. So now, the album been done. The whole thing was, the album it was the Legion. It was called the album is the Legion, three the Bronx way, dope, right? Or, or spin off of the, um, three the hard way. Of course. So, the, even down to the artwork, I was like, all right, I'm gonna be Jim Brown, hell yeah, CeeLo's Fred Williams and Dyke um, Smashes, Jim Kelly album cover just like that right so here in the album in they got it we give them the single we give them the video we got two videos shot everything's ready and oh, you got videos shot and everything everything's ready to go meanwhile while that was recorded I recorded the stuff with show cause I was like yo show people are DMing and sending messages like it would be dope for me to do an album show was like bet let's do it so I started we started recording he wanted show wanted me to do the beats too Right. But I was like, nah, you get you do the beats. I'm gonna pick them, cool. and I'm gonna just write. So it'll Dope. be both of us. Right. You do all of, and I, I mean, I've added some stuff, co-production, but the production is from Showbiz. So we record that, and I put it. It's done. So I put it up. I was like, I want the Legion thing to drop first, then the Molecule Showbiz Bronx Tale, then Dice Solo. We gonna we gonna call Dice. His is going like it was a, a spinoff of a lot of. Movies, right, from, right, and it's, it's crazy. Bronx movies, Carlito's way, except it's gonna be Dice Man's way, right. And then Smash Solo Project is gonna be um, taking another Pelham. He's gonna be on the cover oh, with the glasses, cause you know Smash wears glasses like Denzel. Right. So I was like, I got this in my head how I wanted to play out. And this guy, he dropped the ball. He told me, oh yeah, I'm, I got the test press for the single. Videos ready to go. They about to send me the test press for the album. So I. Eclipse, DJ Eclipse, he's he's managing us now. Like for the first time in we never had management except it's for Dennis Scott. Right. So Eclipse, that's a whole nother story, but he took a liking to us and, and now we're together. So I told him, I said, I got this I got molecules presents done, showbiz done, but I want this Legion thing to come out first. So once he took once the guy from the label, his name is Benny. Ill Adrenaline Records. All right, and he um, said, "Oh, was, oh I'm, 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 I'm uh, about to get the test press." So then I pressed the button with 
with uh, Fat Beats. I'm like, okay, here, give them this. So when he drops this, right. we'll, the showbiz joint will come 30 days after the Legion album. Right. You know, so they'll be like, oh, snap, I got to get, I got the Legion album, so now I got to get the Yeah, the momentum album. starts to really yeah, roll. Exactly. This guy sends me emails. He's he's not getting back to me, and I'm like, yo, what the hell's going on? So now Fat Beast is moving. They done sent me a test press in October, so okay. they're ready to go. So then that's when I said, all right, show, let's shoot the cover, let's shoot a video, and we about we about to about to drop. I'm just waiting Dope. for them to. Now they they got they got to fix the artwork. That's what they're doing right now because they said the the pixels of the cover where it says Bronx Tail is not as crisp. So some tweaks in yeah, there, tweak but you're done though. Yeah, basically. it's done. It's done. It'd probably be out another month or two. Cool. I can't wait to to, yeah. to hear it and to plug it and yeah, stuff, man. Definitely. And uh, I, I'll let you see the video before I leave out of here. Oh, that's what's up. Yeah, I love that. Um, and just want to just thank you for taking your time with it too, man. It was uh, been um, just awesome to catch up. I haven't seen you in a yeah, while. Yeah, it's been yeah, years, yeah, really. Yes, man. Um, like, Peter, yeah. you're a good dude, man. And, um, Thank you so much. I appreciate that. You're my first. You too. You're the first Molecules interview, man. <laughs> really? First, As just yeah. by yourself? Really? By myself. You're the first. Oh, man. Well, good looking out there. I appreciate <laughs> that. And uh, what an interview it was. I mean, it was. You have a, a an incredible story. You yeah, know, just. Yeah. I think. I mean, it, we all do, really. If you really yeah. talk about someone's life yeah. and stuff, yeah. you know, yeah. like. But. Just uh, you know, growing up in the Bronx and and the stuff with the rooftop and everything as a teenager and just like New York at that time yeah. and then just to your whole career through music because it's when you're working as a producer um, and you're especially when you're in that world of of big pop records and and uh, but but sort of working with lots of different kinds of artists and and, and players and that. You can do a lot of work that people are never get a chance yeah, to hear right. or see. Yo, man, I did. I mean, we we done. We're about to wrap up, but it's so much like from childhood in the Bronx to music. Like I did a track for Dela mm. that that didn't get released because at the time I did it, I think they were leaving Tommy Boy, and then then they went independent. Oh wow! I did stuff did stuff with Drez, but Drez stuff. I'm on his stuff comes out. I done. I got songs with Chi, Chi Ali before the before he went on the run. Wow! And I, nobody ever heard. And that's another thing that I'm thinking about getting ready to put out because I got about maybe seven songs, eight songs. Oh, amazing! That nobody yeah, that's heard. cool. So yeah, what a I mean, what a what a incredible crazy yeah, story so that is too. Man, I done. I, yes, definitely in this pop game, but like the hip hop game, I, I'm on on the most deaf album. Right. Yeah. Um, I forgot what song that was. Life is real. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I did that, and then um, I did some stuff with um, Money Boss Play. It's like, yeah, it's a lot of things that I might have touched. Uh, Source Money. You did Money Boss. Some stuff with Money Boss that uh, didn't come out. No, it came out. Actually, they had a video for it. Really? It's a, they got a double video. The second part of the video, I did that. Oh, that's I forgot the up. name of the song. Yeah, what, Minnesota. What an yeah, incredible Bronx uh, yeah, a producer. I, I grew up with him, and me and Min that's a that's a whole that's a more stories. Me and Minnesota used to be in the rooftop together. Like I used to bump into him. Wow. We used to be in there with this kid from around our way named Dave Presley, and him Dave had the Jetta back then, and, and Min they, I used to bump into Minnesota. And, like I said, I, Minnesota. Lord Tariq, they we all from the same right. area, so I grew up with those dudes. Well, you're part of a great tradition. I mean, yeah. from from uh, especially of uh, hip hop producers and, and and MCs. So it's just it's dope, and I appreciate you coming here and doing yeah, this. Man, thank thank you again. Okay. Thanks, yeah, thanks, thanks so much. Thanks. All right, cool. Mm, yes, wow, that was great. That was incredible. What a what a conversation. I want to say thank you to my guest, Molecules, of course. The Legion, Chucky Smash, CeeLo, the Dice Man, uh, was a pleasure to talk to, to Kules. What a generous, kind dude. He came through the crib, and uh, we had a great conversation. And, you know, believe it or not, that was basically his first formal interview, I, I, I suppose, in, in the sense of an artist interview, if you will. It was more just a casual conversation. At least that's how I like to look at it, um, as I do with these podcasts. You have been listening to The House List. This is my weekly podcast produced and hosted by 
me, Peter Agasta, and I want to thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, like I said in the intro, we're also now on Google Play. You can find us there, as well as the usual places where all finer podcasts are available, including the Stitcher app, SoundCloud, and of course on iTunes. If you prefer to listen to it on iTunes, please subscribe, uh, rate it if you can, you know. Um, all that uh, I would appreciate it if you are listening on SoundCloud if that's how you choose to do it so I think that may be another very accessible way for a lot of folks to, to check them out then hit that retweet button if you if you're uh, or subscribe on SoundCloud Wh- whichever means uh, that you can check it out just help me get the word out a little bit you know what I'm saying it, it does go far this is a word-of-mouth DIY type of thing self-funded and uh, you know I try to pick the guests whom I'm a fan of whom I'd love to have a conversation with and just share it on this platform, regardless of genre, as you know, from episode to episode, it switches up a little bit. And, uh, there's something about artists from the Bronx too, particularly hip hop artists from the Bronx. And that hopefully will continue to be a running theme here. Uh, I have some in the works and what a story, um, uh, you know, molecules was and what a uh, signature Bronx story i was thinking i was watching uh just wrapped up watching westworld yes not going to get into that but there was a moment where jeffrey wright's character on the last i think the last episode said welcome to the world i think that's what he said and uh, i was thinking really quickly how that's how you say the bronx like when you go to the bronx you don't say bronx it's the bronx like the world like the rooftop and so when you go up there, it is entering a world into itself. And I think the hip hop artists that came out of there, um, regardless of what time period, but definitely the acts of, of the uh, of the late eighties into the mid nineties, it's just this very particular stylistic approach, sound, very soulful, individualistic kind of vibe that you only find in the Bronx. Speaking of that, uh, when the time comes, the Showbiz and Molecules project is called The Bronx Tale. I don't have the pre, pre-order pre information now, but regardless, you know, peep it out. Whenever you check this podcast out, it may, may be right when I post it or it could be down the line. But pick that up. Of course, you know, my favorite, uh, very slept on underrated album, The Legion's debut record, called theme plus echo equals krill i know that this was re-released i think in 2015 uh on fat beats records on vinyl and and all the other mediums you can also find it on itunes i know that i would definitely recommend it i'm gonna i'm gonna close the show out with a joint from that definitely one of my favorite joints on the album um and let it ride uh let's see what else i wanted to say um if you are on twitter um Please follow us at the Houseless Pod. At Houseless Pod. There's no the Houseless Pod. Uh, that's how I kind of announce little updates. You know, it's just a little means to stay connected. You can even write us an email at the Houseless Podcast at Gmail. All that information is available too on the SoundCloud, which is backslash Houseless Podcast on SoundCloud. If you wanted to follow Molecules on Twitter, that's at Molecules BX. So check him out. Definitely peep out the Legion. Those are my dudes. Very cool. Very generous cats. Um, And I'm a huge fan, of course. I could say it again and again. I love that album. So slept on. What a great story. And the canon of Bronx artists, Showbiz and AG, Chia Lee, Black Sheep, in that canon. So great. Um, Yeah, I could go on and on. There's many other great Bronx artists that we'll get to incoming episodes thank you guys again for tuning in shout to my man molecules this episode as all previous ones are edited and engineered by my man cj stewart again uh yeah spread the word if you can y'all peace i'm gonna take this one out with the legion i like the way it's going down Kill ah, party people this one is what we call I like the way it's going down. This is what I'm saying, the first of me. I'm just coming out with the Legion, and I like the way it's going down. Come on, come on. Legion take it from the top. Always blowing up the spot and making the spot hot. With the sounds of the D, make it fiend. We call LT, always seem like we frontin' on the dream. In the cloud, and we hardcore and proud. Now say it loud, I'm hardcore and I'm proud. And if you feel you can't proceed and do it with the ease, just let it flow, yo, cause this is what we need. Strip.